Majority Report with Sam Cedar. The destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report. With Sam Cedar. <laughs> and I get the feeling you've been cheated. It is Tuesday, July 2nd, 2019. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five time award winning majority report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal. In the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, professor of psychology, Stanford University, Jennifer Eberhardt, on Biased, uncovering the hidden prejudice that shapes what we see, think, and do. Also on the program today, Trump will get his tanks for his corrupt July 4th celebration. Bill Barr now given more say over the immigration courts. Meanwhile, an investigation launches into the 10,000 custom border agents who are all on a racist Facebook group. Meanwhile, a Honduran immigrant dies in ICE facility in Texas while others tell Congress people they are forced to drink from toilets. Back in Capitol Hill, Democrats sue finally to get Donald Trump's tax returns. Bernie Sanders raises $18 million in small donations in Q1, or no, excuse me, Q2. And lastly, Think Progress is for sale. All this and more on today's program. Yes, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to this uh, Tuesday episode of the Majority Report on this abbreviated week. We will uh, not have a show on July 4th. Maybe we'll just have, uh, we'll just release audio of tanks rolling down the streets. Um, you'll recall that Donald Trump has wanted to have tanks, I think, at his inauguration and then uh, subsequent uh, July 4th celebrations because he became enamored with the idea of large military shows of strength and missiles and whatnot that he saw the North Koreans do, and uh, maybe, I think, for Bastille Day. And he wants uh, all sorts of toys and people saluting at me. The other thing to keep in mind with this celebration on July 4th is that uh, they are now using it to, as a mechanism to drive fundraising for the Republicans. Now, many of you are probably too young to remember Lincoln's Bedroom. But Lincoln's Bedroom became popularized by the right, I think it was in the 90s now, because Bill Clinton, some of Bill Clinton's top donors, spent a night in the Lincoln Bedroom at the White House. How's it feel? And they were allowed to come in in this instance, basically, tickets are being sold for the sake of Republican donors directly. There's no sort of, you're a big campaign contributor, come to the White House and visit me. It's come to this celebration for money and only for money that will go into Republican hands. Literally leveraging a, an event, creating an event with tax dollars. Incidentally... 
Well, we'll talk more about this um, after we hear Donald Trump make an announcement, I guess, about what's going to happen on the 4th. Thanks out on 4th of July at the Lincoln Memorial for speech. We're going to have a great 4th of July in Washington, D.C. It'll be like no other. It'll be special. And I hope a lot of people come. And it's going to be uh, about this country. And it's a salute to America. And I'm going to be here. I'm going to say a few words. And we're going to have planes going be overhead. The best fighter jets in the world and other planes, too. And we're going to have some tanks stationed outside. Got to be pretty careful with the tanks because the roads have a tendency not to like to carry heavy tanks, so we have to put them in certain areas. But we have the brand new Sherman tanks, so we have the brand new uh, Abram tanks, and we have uh, some incredible equipment, military equipment on display, brand new, and uh, we're very proud of it. You know, we're making a lot of new tanks right now. We're building a lot of new tanks in Lima, Ohio. Uh, a great tank factory that people wanted to close down until I got elected and I stopped it from being closed down. And now it's a very productive facility and they do no, the greatest tank in the world. Now, the idea of us getting into a massive land war that's going to require uh, whole new fleets of tanks is um, pretty hard to imagine. But at least we've got a lot of them and now we can show them off at parades. And just in case you were wondering about this July 4th celebration, it's going to be a lot about America. One of the things, too. In contrast to other July 4th celebrations. Right. (laughs) Apologizing for America. First of all, I'm sorry. All right. Now go make your hot dogs, you white devils. The Parks Department is getting charged for transporting the tanks by the military. You know, the Parks Department that's already hurting for funding. It's just, uh, it's, it's grotesque and um, slightly reminiscent of this. Attack! <laughs> oh boy, oh boy. Oh boy, oh boy. <laughs> The there you go. Hong Kong goes to truck. <laughs> Anthony Adamrick. Still almost as Trump as Trump. But um, uh, I mean, this is uh, uh, welcome to the new America. And I, I just don't I, I know there's going to be a ton of people are going to be out there psyched to see those uh, tanks. I don't know why we don't have um, missiles, too. Why are you sharing ideas? I mean, why not? I mean, look, if you why look at those incredible there? North Korean and People's Liberation Army parades, they have missiles. Trump should be in fatigues standing out of, out of a limo. I, that would be amazing to watch. I would also, maybe Especially what we should also keep his balance flatbed with some is. charred bodies just to show like the handiwork of the tanks. That Speaking stinks. of which. But I guess that's, we don't get that to the second term of uh, Trump. Uh, meanwhile, you fly some bodies back in of any places in the across the world that were killing people. Meanwhile, um, several congresswomen went down to uh, and men uh, went to tour some facilities. There's a lot happening on the um, migrant concentration camp front. We will talk more about this big ProPublica story from yesterday that basically underco- uh, uh, uncovers a customs and a border protection, I guess, a Facebook group made up of former and uh, existing border agents who uh, trade racist memes and mock uh, dead immigrants, as well as those in Congress who may uh, be supportive of immigrants not being um, abused in these camps. Here is an image of one of the camps from above. I mean, I don't know where, where, which, where is this one, uh, Brendan? This one is uh, in McAllen, Texas in May. 
2015, we've reported that uh, the Department of Homeland Security apparently was afraid at that time of potential riots. I mean, you look at this, it's not terribly surprising. That's just un- extraordinary. These images are, frankly, they're re- you know what they're reminiscent of is uh, New Orleans after Katrina. People uh, living in the stadium there. But this is not, obviously, a natural disaster. It's a man-made one. There is a surge of immigrants coming in. These um, detention centers, as they're calling them, were not designed to hold people for extended periods of time, but they have created the circumstance why they have this backlog of people in these places. And it came out in the uh, Democratic debate. We've talked about this for a while. They have criminalized coming across the border. They are separating parents from children. Um, And this is what you get. They're scaring immigrants from picking up the kids. They want these images out there. I'm not convinced. But they, they do so with the misguided belief that parents who are afraid of their kids being murdered or raped in some of the most violent cities in the world. If that's where the kids have to go to be safe, that's what they'll do. So a couple of uh, Congress people went down there to tour the facility. Here's Ayanna Presley. She is, understand right now, she was giving a uh, press conference and the... Uh, the Congress people got surrounded by, I guess, people who were cheering on for abuse of immigrants. I don't know what you would call them. Counter protesters, fascists, um, thugs, authoritarians, bigots, psychopaths. She responds directly back to them. Keep yelling. This is very appropriate. Vile rhetoric for vile actions. Hateful rhetoric for hateful behavior. Racist words and venom for racist policies. Very apropos. This is bigger than a funding debate or about any speeches that we give here on the floor of the House of Representatives. This is about the preservation of our humanity. And this is about seeing every single person there as a member of your own family. I am tired of the health and the safety, the humanity, and the full freedoms of black and brown children being negotiated and compromised and moderated. We need a system that works, that is humane, and that is compassionate, and that keeps families together. I learned a long time ago that when change happens, it's either because people see the light or they feel the fire. Today we are lifting up these stories in the hopes that you will see the light. And if you don't, we will bring the fire. That's pretty powerful Excellent. Uh, stuff. She's um, exactly right. Apparently um, down there it's uh, being reported that uh, by, the, by New York Times national correspondent Simon Romero that uh, Rashida Tlaib uh, was there and a uh, Trump heckler was yelling, we don't want Muslims here either. We don't care about Sharia law. We care about Jesus Christ. Go care about your own country. Um, apparently there's some more uh, video of that. Um, do we have a video of the uh, uh, of some of those protesters yelling there? I mean, good for these. I don't. I mean, frankly, I'm not sure why it's taken this long. If you recall, the first time that somebody basically um, got up in front of one of these facilities um, was uh, uh, not was Jeff Merkley. Senator Jeff Merkley went down there um, months and months ago now. 
Are you going to tell the truth or have a fire Is it just to come off? Is it the new image working on? You know nothing of our people. It's all you do. Go away. Go away. Taxation is theft. Taxation is theft. They're yelling. Thanks for that. Shit, Ocasio, do something about the border. Do your job. Do your job, Ocasio, you piece of shit. Do your job. There you go. So, um, nice. I mean, yeah, I was I was reminded uh, reading this weekend of how like all of this stuff was you know was brewing for years, particularly in Arizona. And these these groups of people going out and doing stuff that we still regularly see, like pouring out water bottles that were left for migrants, right. as an example, uh, and then that kind of fusing with this conspiracy theory culture and a strategic shift for the Republican Party to not even pretend, right? Like that was the autopsy after 2012. Should we pretend to not be bigots? Right. And they decided more effective to just be authentically bigoted. Uh, we will get to uh, Professor Eberhardt in just a moment. It's a an interview I recorded with her, I guess it was about a month ago uh, now, which seems like ages ago. Um, but I want to remind you, we all want a haven, a place that feels uniquely you or us. With Joy, Bar, or Joy Bird, you get one-of-a-kind furniture crafted after your, your own unique taste can turn your ideas into reality with hundreds of styles and options. They have all sorts of different uh, choices you can make here. Rich buttery leather or the plushest velvet you've ever felt. You want a sofa in aquatic blue, a love seat in bubblegum pink? They got it. If you dream it, Joybird can make it a reality. They even have a beautiful selection of outdoor sofas, lounge chairs, and tables. Plus, their free personal design consultants can help you nail down your own design. Joybird offers a range of kid and pet friendly upholstery options so that your creations can stand the test of time. I, I wish. Both my kids are out of uh, that zone now. It's all mostly out of that zone. Joybird uh, also offers a range. Uh, sorry. Uh, best of all, thanks to their 365 day home trial. If you don't love your Joybird, you can return it for a full refund. See how Joybird can help you design your dream space. Find your joy today at joybird.com slash majority. You can create the furniture that brings you joy. Joybird.com slash majority. Go over there now. Check out the stuff. You won't believe the choices that you have. Their ability to custom all these things. You can receive an exclusive offer of 25% off your first order. By using the code MAJORITY. So that's joybird.com slash majority. Use the code MAJORITY for 25% off. All right, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we'll be talking uh, to Jennifer Eberhardt, the author of Biased. Program Professor of Psychology at Stanford University, winner of the 2014 MacArthur Genius Grant, and author of Biased, Uncovering the Hidden Prejudice that Shapes What We See, Think, and Do. Jennifer Eberhardt, uh, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me. So let's just start with um, the, the notion of implicit bias. What, what do you mean uh, by that? Well, you know, implicit bias or unconscious bias is something that we're all vulnerable to. Um, and in my book, I'm trying to really show the science behind it. And, and it's, it's, it's basically our beliefs and our feelings that we have about social groups that can influence our decision making and our actions, even when we're not aware of it. So when we say um, uh, someone has implicit bias against um, uh, black people, how is that different? in in your um, uh, sense than racism 
or 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 is that a specific type of racism? I'm sorry. Can you say that again? Well, um, it, when we talk about when we talk about implicit bias, well, how is that different from uh, racism, or is it simply a different type of racism? Oh, I see. So, so yeah. So, I, I think when people think about racism, they're thinking about um, you know people who are filled with hate, and uh, you know people who are kind of like old-fashioned uh, racists what we would call them and um but but here with with this kind of implicit bias or unconscious bias you don't really have to be a bigot to be biased you can have bias that's triggered and can have real you know negative impact despite you know our intentions and despite our desire to be fair okay all right well let's i mean let's talk about some of the um the the the, i guess the the impetus for uh, some of your work. I mean, both of it, uh, you, you mentioned both your experience as a child and um, your uh, child's experience when he was, was quite young. Why don't we start with, um, with uh, your child? You start the book um, when you were on a plane with, I think your, your, your son, who was, I think five at that time. Uh, tell us about that, um, uh, that event. Yes, yeah, so we were on an airplane uh, flying uh, uh, back to uh, California together, and he's excited to be on the plane, and he looks all around, and he's you know, kind of checking the people out, and he sees a man there, and he says, hey, you know, that guy looks like Daddy. And I look at the guy, um, and he doesn't look anything at all like my husband, and so that led me to start looking around on the plane, and I realized he was the only black man on the plane, and so... I um, am about to have a conversation right with my son about how not all black people look alike. (laughs) And uh, before I could have that conversation, though, he looks up at me and he says, I hope he doesn't rob the plane, you know? And so I'm like, what, what do you mean? Uh, You know, daddy wouldn't rob a plane. And he says, yeah, I know. And I said, well, why would you say that? And he said, well, um, I don't know why I said that. You know, I don't know why I was thinking that. Um, So this is a, good example of, of someone who is kind of picking up, um, you know, things from the world around him and um, picking up this association basically between blackness and crime um, that he doesn't know where he got it from, um, but somehow he's been exposed to it and he's acting on it. Um, what is your sense of where your son could have picked that up? I mean, as a, you know, I have a, a six year old, um, and you know, uh, this was, I guess, a, um, a, a decade or, or so more, but where, where would that form? I mean, was that a function of, of his association? I mean, is it your sense that that was a sense, a, a sense of his association with blackness or was it his sense of, I mean, or, or, or what? Well, I mean, I think it's it's a function of kind of being in the world where, um, you know, you hear about, um, you know, you kind of, as a child, you're learning about people's uh, position in society and, and sort of, you know, what kinds of beliefs that you have about certain social groups. And, um, you know, as a child, you're, you're, you're trying to figure out, right, what correlates with what. Um, he's trying to sort of think about how people maybe um, react to African-American men in public spaces and whether they give them a lot of room, whether they lock their car doors, you know, all of those kinds of things. Uh, you know, children kind of pick up from us uh, what um, we, we feel and, and how they should then feel and think about other people. Um, and uh, so That's one way. I, I think the media is another way. I mean, there's a lot of ways, but that, that's one way. And um, let's also talk about uh, since we're in sort of the realm of uh, of childhood is your um, your experience in switching schools. I guess it was uh, elementary school or junior high, um, and um, which you uh, ultimately became. I guess maybe in some ways inspiration for some of your work. Yeah, so I grew up um, in an all black neighborhood in uh, Cleveland, Ohio, and my parents announced one day that we were going to move to a suburb of Cleveland called Beachwood, which at the time was almost all white. And so I was worried about uh, making that move and how I would be accepted and whether I would have friends, whether I would feel like I could belong there, all those things. And 
uh, when I when I actually did move, I found that the students were really friendly. They were really welcoming. Um, they uh, you know wanted to show me around and all of that. Um, but I still had problems making friends, and that had to do uh, with the fact that I could not um, tell their faces apart. Um, I wasn't used. To, I wasn't exposed to. Um, uh, you know, white uh, people very much. Uh, then I lived in this neighborhood again that was entirely black. So all of my sort of the most meaningful interactions and relationships that I formed with, with were with other black people, and so it was hard for me to actually, um, you know, to <laughs> to be able to recognize their, their faces. It was um, and, and it shocked me because I didn't anticipate you know this at all. I I never had that kind of problem before, but. You know, here I was, um, you know, trying to make friends, and I couldn't tell uh, one person from the other. And and it actually took me some time to, to figure it out. Over time, I, I was able to um, figure it out, but my brain, you know, needed time to uh, adjust to the new environment and to the new demands that I was, you know, that, that were placed on me in that new environment. And so over time, I was, I was able to, um, you know, develop that skill. But before then, I, I didn't have it. And and so subsequent to that, obviously, um, you have um, there is you, you've come across research and uh, partaken in research that suggests that this is that that phenomena is physiological. Yes. Yeah, so we've done some research. So I collaborated with a number of um, memory uh, specialists uh, at Stanford and we conducted a neural imaging study to look at this very issue. Um, what scientists call it is the other race effect, and it's basically that people are much better at recognizing faces of their own race and faces of other races. And we wanted to understand the neural underpinnings of, of that effect. And so we put people in a neural imaging scanner, both black and white study participants, and we showed them images of, of black and white faces. And we looked at what happened, you know, in, in, in their brain as they were shown these images. And there's an area of the brain called the fusiform face area, um, and that's highly implicated in um, face processing. And so we were really focused on that area. And we found that it was, that area was much more activated to faces um, of their own race than to faces of other races. Now, is that strictly um, a, a a biological development? I mean, what what can that be? Can that be impacted based upon where someone lit? Like, if, if if we were to take an, an image of your brain uh, prior to switching schools and an image of your brain uh, two years later, would your ability to react to faces of a different race have changed or would that dynamic still be there and you would have developed other sort of mechanisms to make up for the reduced brain activity? That's a great question. Um, so, so I would guess that my brain would have changed over that time, that, that this area, this uniform face area would become more responsive to faces outside of my own race. And we have some research on that too, actually, where we, looked at this process developmentally um, and uh, we found that for people who actually stay, um, you know, in, you know, their own, uh, you know, in, in these neighborhoods that are racially segregated, um, they, um, you know, initially you're showing, you know, some responsiveness to all faces. And then as you uh, get older, um, you start to see a, a differential response to faces of, your own race versus another race. And then as an adult, you see that effect that's even stronger. So, so it's not just the, um, you know, the, you know, our biology or, you know, our brain wiring, but our, our brain wiring is a function of uh, our social environment. So if we change our social environment and we, we, we change who we're exposed to, then we can also change how our brain is functioning. That that's, that's, um, that's pretty nuts in a way. I mean, I mean, that makes sense to me, <laughs> but I mean, that's like, I mean, I mean, cause theoretically, right. Like, um, you know, just to continue to use, um, uh, you as a child in that scenario, your brain could have changed, you know, uh, two years later. And so you, you can recognize and differentiate and your brain can register that you can differentiate between white people, right. but theoretically, right. You could then move to a different school where it is, um, 
you know, predominantly Asian and then go through that process all over again. Yes. Or, or does, yes. Yes. so yes, is it, is, is it, that's t- right. Okay. So it's, 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 it's tied to sort of difference in races that in races in particular, as opposed to just like you don't have a certain muscle for lack of a better, uh, a term in your brain. Like that muscle is not generic. It is, uh, it is something that is learned and you can see a change in your brain that is specific to specific races. Right. You can see a change in your brain that actually specific to specific races. If, if, if you're not exposed to faces of that other race at all, you get less activation in that area of the fusiform face area. But as you're exposed to those faces more and more over time, your brain adjusts. So, so the finding was really about neuroplasticity. Uh, so just because we see, um, you know, a difference in how the brain is responding or what gets activated uh, doesn't mean that that's a, a permanent difference, that, that it's actually, you know, the brain can kind of change uh, based on, um, you know, who we're interacting with and uh, what our social environment is like. And, I mean, I don't want to get too uh, stuck on this, but I find this this part really fascinating. Is there also a, a, a col- uh, uh, like a, a coincident uh, uh, effect in terms of... Um, you know, I would imagine if you go into a room and you can't differentiate people um, in the same way that you could, you know, in a different room, let's say, that that would right. create a certain amount of anxiety. Um, and yes. the more stuff that's in there that is not just foreign, but foreign in the sense that you don't even have a capacity to process it in the same way. Right. Um, I would right. imagine that that creates all sorts of sort of subsequent social reactions. Right. I mean, it does. I mean, so for example, you may not um, want to associate with those people as much because it's, you know, leading to this anxiety. You're worried about making a mistake where you're confusing one person, you know, for the other. And so, yes, it could have all of these other downstream uh, consequences. In my case, you know, I actually needed to uh, be able to, uh, you know, to differentiate among white faces because, you know, that, that you know, that was my new community, right? So I, I needed to be able to um, figure it out. And over time, I was able to figure it out. But, but even, like, I was super motivated, right, uh, to, to do this, but I couldn't do that right away. It, it, it took my um, brain sort of time to, um, and enough exposure to these faces over and over again before I got the hang of it. Okay, and uh, so let's talk about a couple other um, uh, examples of this implicit bias that you have um, established through uh, some of of, uh, of the studies that you have done, and and then I, I just want to come back around to you know questions that may be slightly outside your portfolio, but uh, that your work obviously has implications of. But let's talk just a little bit about. Um, the, uh, the you did uh, one experiment with, um, or I should say, uh, study with um, with uh, w- with subliminal words that were flashed in front of uh, police officers, and then associated it with faces. Uh, just uh, walk us through that study and what the implications were. So yeah, so this was a study that we were interested in, um, sort of uh, getting uh, police officers to think about violent crime. And we were interested in whether when they thought about violent crime, if that would lead them to focus uh, their attention on black male faces. So for the study, we had them sit in front of the computer and we flashed uh, words on the computer and we flashed the words at such a uh, rapid rate that they couldn't consciously detect them. And the words were either words that were associated with violent crime or not. So some of the participants got words that were all associated with violent crime, like arrest and apprehend and capture and shoot and those kinds of words. Um, and then we had a control group that didn't get any of those words. And then we showed uh, two faces on the, on the computer screen simultaneously. And one was a black male face and the other was a white male face. And we were interested in which face they would look at. And it turned out that those officers who've been exposed to 
words that were, you know, associated with violent crime, like capture and arrest and so forth, they they moved their eyes away from the white face and onto the black face. So it was the black face that captured their attention. And for us, this was um, a way of almost looking at racial profiling in the um, in a laboratory because, I mean, that's what profiling is about, right, is when, you know, officers are on the lookout for violent crime, you know, does the racial category of the person um, matter at all for who they attend to and who they may stop and who they may search and so forth. And so um, this is a, I don't know, a, a version of that, a stripped down version of that that we tried in the laboratory with officers. And that, and that almost establishes which I think like you, you know, I feel like you could you could take those same uh, police officers and take them out for a drink, and within a half an hour or so, you could get a sense of 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 what the results of that test might be. Um, but that w- would that establish sort of from a clinical perspective. I mean, tell us about this notion of categorical knowledge, because this is basically like the brain. I mean, I get the sense that it's just, the description is um, the brain just can't handle stuff as much, I mean, chaos on some level. And so it has to divvy stuff up and this is the way that chips fall. Yes, that's exactly right. So um, categorization is a, is a, is a tool that our brain uses to kind of make sense of everything that we're uh, bombarded with in the world. And so uh, we need a way, we, we can't, you know, take in everything at once. And so we need a way to sort through it and to package it and to, you know, uh, you know, to to, to, um, to to categorize it so that we're able to um, establish some kind of you know control you know over the world, but also uh, some coherence. And so, uh, so so this is one tool that we use, and we categorize you know not just people, but we categorize everything. Right? We categorize furniture and cars, and you know we uh, categorize you know flowers and. You, you name it, uh, dogs and cats and, and, and so forth. And so that helps us to, um, you know, to, it, it establishes some kind of order, I guess, over what we're seeing and allows us to, um, you know, to be able to form expectations and, 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 and so forth. But when we do this with people, when we categorize people, uh, um, those social groups, um, then we also might develop um, beliefs about the people who are in that category, and we call those belief stereotypes. And we also may develop feelings about people in that category, and which we call prejudice. And the, the, the stereotypes and, and that prejudice together is what we call bias. And the concern is is that for people, that bias can influence uh, how we treat them. It can influence how we make decisions about them and so forth. So, I mean, it, it sounds like, and, and we should say there was another study where it was almost the reverse of the one you just explained, where um, you would see, uh, where you showed um, subjects images of, of black faces and white faces, and then uh, had other images sort of come into focus slowly. And, right. and right. just explain that, because then I, I just want to make, uh, I want to uh, go further with this point of what sounds like we have a um, a physiological predisposition to stereotyping, but but let's but but before you address that, I mean, just tell us about that other study. Yes. Yeah, so with the other study, uh, what we did is we had people sit in front of a computer screen, and then we exposed them to a series of faces, um, and uh, so some of the participants got a series of black male faces, and others got a series of white male faces. Now these um, faces were coming on the screen at such a rapid rate that they couldn't consciously perceive them. And so it just seemed like there were flickers of light that they were watching. And then after that, uh, we had them uh, perform what we call an object recognition task. And for that object recognition task, they saw an object appear on the screen. And it was really, really blurry at first. And then slowly in 41 steps or 41 frames, um, the object became more clear. And the participant's goal was to simply tell us at what point they could recognize the object. And we found that if they had been exposed to the black male faces beforehand, they were able to recognize the crime-relevant objects a lot 
faster. So if they, you know, if they saw a blurry image of a gun, say, they were able to um, recognize uh, that gun really quickly. Um, whereas if they were exposed to white male faces beforehand, they needed more information, they needed more frames or more clarity before they could see that that was a gun. It was that... Was that was there a disparity between the race of the subject at all in terms of making those assessments? No, not at all. So th- this is one of the things that arguments we make here that it's not, um, you know, sort of a bias isn't something that one group holds and the other doesn't. I mean, this uh, bias, I think, is um, something that we're all, um, you know, it, it, you know, we're we're kind of. Uh, vulnerable to uh, because there's a, a, an association between blackness and crime that's out there in our society and it's out there for a variety of reasons but we're all picking up on it and and the, the argument here is that that association between blackness and crime is so strong that it can influence not only how we see people but it can influence how we see objects and in this case these for these um, crime objects like guns and knives and so forth but how does that I mean like I, I, so so there is something in society, right? And and let's and maybe it's an a, a, a amalgamation of things, right? Like television, news, right. what uh, you know, uh, culture, whatever that that associates right. uh, uh, black males with crime. But right. and, and but but if I'm living in a in, in, and if I'm living in like a white enclave and I'm going and, and almost everyone I deal with is white and I have no, uh, you know, or limited exposure to black people. Um, and so I have no even like um, real world experiences that push back on that one to one association, as it were. Right. right. Versus I I'm I'm black and my family is black and I know I I have a lot of association with the idea that black males are not criminals. How does that not implicate that subconscious? Like, what is it? What is there a is is there something out there that has like precedence in terms of the way that it influences our subconscious that even overrides our own personal experiences? Oh, yeah. So that's a great question. I, I mean, I think I mean, so there is some literature in psychology suggesting that contact really matters, right? So especially if you have positive contact, like the contact that you just described, um, I think that that matters, um, you know, in terms of uh, how people, you know, uh, treat one another and, and you know, how, um, you know, so it lessens discrimination, basically, and it can also decrease um, sort of negative racial attitudes towards the other group and so forth, um, or, or even towards your own group, if, if, if there's a societal um, sort of attitude that's negative about your own group, right, that, that they can buffer you to some extent. Um, but with these studies, we were just looking at whether there was an association there at all, but, um, and, 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 and it's, you know, an association, again, where it's not, it's not something that's conscious, so you couldn't decide, okay, I'm going to override this thing because I know it's not true and I know that um, I have all of these, um, you know, other, um, you know, interactions with, with, with people in these positive ways that tell me that it's not true. Um, it, 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 it's, it's hard to, you know, even if you have that experience, you also have this other pretty powerful experience, at least in this country, that associates um, blackness with crime. And so it, it's hard to just completely undo the association, even though you might be at a conscious level, when you know that that association is triggered, you might um, be able to stop it from um, influencing, you know, what decisions you make or what actions you take. So, so even contact does not imp. I mean, because it's because if if there's no differential between race as they they go through that uh, study, uh, that contact doesn't mitigate your subconscious uh, beliefs at all. It just it mitigates only how those subconscious beliefs can be overridden in the context of the way you behave. But it's still within your subconscious in the same way. Yeah, I mean, for, for some things, I think some, for some associations, for some stereotypic associations that are really strong, I think that that, that is the case. But I don't want to suggest that contact doesn't matter, you know, um, you know, at all. I, I think, you know, some, sometimes, you know, sometimes 
it does. Uh, you know, sometimes, the, uh, and, and then also if you pair that with all kinds of other things that you can do to mitigate bias, I mean, I, I think um, it's the combination of all these things working together that can, um, you know, that that can that you know that can decrease uh, bias to some extent. So you not only need contact, for example, but you also um, you know need to um, be able to make you know, decisions where you're, where you're not making decisions really quickly and where you have to fall back on, you know, these automatic associations that have built up over time, but you have time to think it through and to, you know, replace those associations with, um, you know, uh, you know, with, with other things that you know about uh, that, that may be contrary, right, right, right to those associations. Are you so, talk- um, you know, so, so, Go ahead. Well, there's a study uh, that uh, you cite about um, orchestras. Um, that were able right. to overcome gender uh, bias by basically having them do, uh, you know, audition behind a, a screen or something, so that you couldn't tell the gender of the player, and that um, that, right. that that mitigated um, uh, disparities in uh, the way that um, orchestras were um, were built. Well, so let me ask you this: I mean, if um, so, we have this this. Do, is it possible? To isolate what specifically is creating um, these associations, I mean, because these are ones you know that that you know we're talking just in terms of the way that they impl- implicate the the subconscious, but that's pretty right. that's pretty crazy that contact might be able to mitigate the way that we react to our subconscious, but if but if but if I understand the study correctly, and what you're saying is that. Um, the subconscious is not necessarily, it can be mitigated, but it can't be directly impacted or shaped by contact in the way that sort of other authoritative messages are. But what, do we know what those authoritative messages, where they come from? Well, I mean, we talked about some of them earlier. I mean, I think, um, just, you know, being out in the world and you um, see how uh, people are reacted to um, in a different way and maybe you yourself a little more fear when you see a black man approaching and if you see a white man approaching, um, you also are um, consuming news, right? Uh, the, um, the either through, you know, online or the television or even local news and you, you know, hear reports that, um, you know, that are associating, um, you know, blackness with crime or, or even, um, you know, your understanding of uh, real world um, statistics, uh, crime statistics. So, um, you know, we talk about mass incarceration, for example, and um, just hearing the statistics about, um, you know, the proportion of, um, you know, of the um, prison population that's black versus white versus Asian and so forth, like, just knowing those facts can lead people to think, oh, okay, well, this means that this, you know, this category um, of, of people, these are people who are inherently criminal, um, especially in the U.S., I think, where, um, you know, there's not a lot of context for, um, you know, how it is that we, um, you know, how these uh, disparities in criminal justice have developed over time. Like, we don't have, a, the average person doesn't, you know, have a sense of what the policies are that created those disparities right. and so forth. And so when you see a disparity, you just think, oh, okay, these are the people who made bad choices and they decided to be criminal. And so, you know, they were locked up. Um, so, so you see what I'm saying? So there's a, there are a lot of, um, there are a lot of things that set that this in, in motion. Uh, this association. Yeah. Yes, so, exactly. So what, at what point does implicit bias turn into racism? in your in the in the way that you uh view these sort of like uh this hierarchy i mean is i mean there's racism involved in creating the implicit bias right which is um setting up a system yeah. where there would be disparities in the way that we imprison people or um the, the way that we right. police people uh there's there's racism um that uh implicates uh you know racial bias I mean, just in the sense of like I would imagine, like, you know, on this level of, like, uh, black people were enslaved. That, you know, I consciously right. am aware that, that that shouldn't happen. But on some level, if, like, they allowed themselves to be slaves, maybe, you know, like, that that may have created some type of, you know, unconscious bias 
um, in, in people. But, but or just well, seeing people as enslaved, right? I mean, just being exposed to that if you lived during that time. Right. You know, and, and, and this is all you knew. You only saw people um, in, in these kinds of positions, and it was completely aligned with race. You know, even if you thought that this wasn't uh, fair or this shouldn't be the case, uh, you're still exposed to it, and that can start to affect you. Uh, if that can start to affect you at this uh, level that, um, you know, this, this level that we're talking about where it's, it's, it can even, you know, affect your unconscious associations of blackness with, um, you know, you know, servitude or uh, blackness and slavery or blackness and uh, inferiority and so forth. And, and presumably it, it would go the other way, too, where um, seeing um, uh, a, a, a black person as president would impact your subconscious on some level in terms of like, OK, um, a black people can be president, uh, that type of thing. Right. right. I mean, I mean presumably right. that would that would that would have some impact as well. But at what point does that implicit bias turn into racism? I mean, is it, it just how you act upon those biases Um or is it, I mean, because I've talked to people who are, um, who, whose understanding of racism is less, you know, from a clinical perspective, but more from like a, you know, um, a, a, a philosophical uh, perspective. And there is a, uh, just a notion of, or maybe even sort of broadly sociological, there's a notion of white supremacy that, um, that, right. that, that we, we all subscribe to in this society, uh, black and white, and, uh, we make decisions in our life. Like, at what point is this, uh, this notion of white supremacy, not the, I'm burning a cross, I'm wearing a hood type of white supremacy, but like, I, I, I want to live in this neighborhood cause it's just a better neighborhood. And I don't, right. I don't like, at what point does not paying attention to these implicit biases constitute racism in your mind. Like I am vaguely aware of like this disparity of thought, but I'm just not going to just not going to address it. Like, you know, like I'm just choosing the best neighborhood I can for my kid, but on some level I'm not my heartstrings. Let's just say for lack of a better way of expressing it are not pulled by the plight of these people over here. Whereas if they were white, maybe I would, maybe they would impact me a little bit more. Like at what point, and maybe this is, you know, sort of outside well, of your portfolio, but right. what point does I that? Mean, so the, go, ahead. go on, sorry. Go ahead. Well, I'm just curious at what point, you know, from your perspective, does that, have we crossed a certain threshold? Right. I mean, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I mean, really what we're talking about with this implicit bias or this unconscious bias is, um, sort of acting on um, stereotypes or, or your beliefs or acting on feelings without really being aware that that's what you're doing. Um, but it's, it, that's separate from the impact that that can have. So you can have bias that, that has a pretty uh, devastating impact, whether it's conscious bias and I'm burning across or it's um, this kind of bias that you're talking about where you just decide, you know, you like this neighborhood better than this other neighborhood and you're not aware, you know, of the, of the way that, that uh, bias is playing in that decision making. So you, you can still, um, both kinds of, of biases can lead to pretty devastating uh, outcomes, which is why we care about the implicit bias. I mean, we, we care about the unconscious bias. Uh, it's not, even though it's more subtle uh, than the clock's burning, it can um, have effects that, that are equally damaging as this more conscious uh, thing that you're deciding uh, that uh, you don't like these people and you're going to act on it. So, all right. So lastly, I mean, I've uh, interviewed uh, folks who have said that the, the presidency of uh, Barack Obama and the, the, sub, the subsequent presidency of, of Donald Trump and his campaign sort of racialized a lot of areas um, in a way that were uh, surprisingly to me not as racialized bef- before that. And uh, at least in, in, in modern history, in terms of like certain pol- political issues and whatnot, how much... Why is it that this implicit bias, which exists, you know, across races and presumably, you know, across various uh, people, you know, white people, 
Um, why is it that um, some people got <clears throat> what why what, what is it that makes this implicit bias i guess susceptible to being more activated or more predominant in the world view of people like my sense is is that things have become much more um, racialized uh in many respects right. and, and and maybe right. and i think the data shows that um presumably this racial bias has not really been impacted dramatically what is it that sort of gives more life to this uh, this implicit bias you know i think one of the things that gives a lot more life to it is uh, the social norms shifting you know so you know the the bias is very responsive to uh, the social norms that that we live uh, under and so to the extent say that have a egalitarian values, and, and this is something that's near and dear to us, say, as Americans, and this is something that we want to strive, you know, towards. Uh, you know, if, if we're appearing that way, we're, we're trying to, um, you know, act in, in ways that are accordant with those values, um, even if we have, um, you know, this implicit bias or these sort of unconscious, like, associations that, that we're making. We're, we're trying to at least outwardly, we're trying to battle that, right? We're trying to kind of live up to the standard that we have. But once those social norms start to, um, you know, erode and, 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 and shift, then it, it can also shift the correlation that we see between, you know, implicit bias and this more explicit, like, racism, if you want to call it that. Mm -hmm. So so the norms matter, and, it, and, and our leaders matter a lot for that. They um, kind of set the tone for what's permissible behavior and what's not. And so... As that uh, comes under fire, or it, it, you know that's being questioned, uh, then it can it can it can move us in the direction of of, of being more biased, and and, and and we have more um, situations under which it's okay now uh, to, to to be biased, or you know if we're you know and e even even people who really um, hold these egalitarian values, um, you know they cherish those values, and it's important to them to you know, behave in accordance with that, you know, even if, for those people, you know, as the social norms shift away from that, that their their behavior can start to change too. Uh, they get pulled in that direction too, because we're all social beings. And, and so we're responding to the social environment around us. And so, so that's why the, I, I, I feel like, you know, that the norms are shifting uh, can make a huge difference. The book is biased. For everybody. The book is Biased, Uncovering the Hidden Prejudice that Shapes What We See, Think, and Do. Professor Jennifer Eberhardt, we will put a link to the uh, book at uh, majority.fm. Thanks so much for your time today. Fascinating stuff. Oh, thank you. Appreciate it. All right, folks, that is the fun half uh, for the program. I mean, I her that last response... The, the, the last um, answer she gave there, I think, is so uh, such an important part of the era that we're living in. Um, when we go to the fun half, we're going to talk about this Facebook group. There are 20,000 custom border patrol agents in the country. That's the denominator. Well, now hold on. That's right. That is the denominator. We don't know what the numerator is. We know there was 9,500 people in this um, Facebook group. I would be... Active and former. Active and former. But we don't know much about these people at all. We know uh, ProPublica has identified three or four active border agents. One that's a supervisor. Um, we don't know how many there are, but I mean, how many there have to have to be for it to make a difference? I mean, honestly, if 5% of an organization distributed between sort of leadership and non-leadership, but 5% of an organization is this corrupted by blatant racism and hatred of immigrants. I mean, how much 
influence do you think that could have throughout that organization, which is already dealing with, you know, every problem they have at work is a function of, well, not every problem, but a large percentage of the problems they have at work has to do with immigration, right? And so there is a, at least a predisposition um, and with an active, literally, force of people trying to, um, who are demonizing these people, I mean, it, you, you can see the, the, how it corrupts an entire organization. And the fact that this group was set up in August of 2016 also, I think, is indicative of what, that, of what uh, the professor was saying in that last answer. There may be an implicit bias that exists in all of us towards other people. But when the nominee of a major political party or pick any other type of, I guess, major public figure, although it would be hard to sort of even come up with an example of someone who has dominated the news more than Donald Trump over the past three or four years in any time in American history. Um, the idea that he gave license to this, I think it's no coincidence this shows up in August of 2016. There's no other reason why it would have. Facebook has been around for a long time. Not, not, not decades. Anti-immigrant sentiment to the extent that uh, was there in 2016, theoretically, was around. But I think there was just a broader license and people would just, you know, time to let my freak flag fl fly. And this is, I think, this is, I think that's the story largely of, not largely, well, largely, it's a, definitely an, a, a, a big component of the election. There was, you know, people were like, how could someone vote for Obama and then vote for Trump and be racist? Well, I mean, I think... Um, well, we've had we've spoken to many, many experts on how that's the case. But um, and that racial animus, racial predispositions, racism uh, plays a big part in that. Of course, you know that's a broad brush. We're not talking about every single person, but and. Um, you know, this stuff gets normalized. When we go back, we'll, we will talk more about this uh, Facebook group, but it's... The, the, this last interview, I mean, it was, it's a little bit different from ones that we generally do because it deals with psychology as opposed to sociology or uh, politics. But this mix between sort of basic psychology and how it interacts with the broader context in the world I think is, is rather important. Uh, to the time that we're living in. And with that said, it's time to the fun, move to the fun half of the program. And a reminder, it's your support that makes this show possible. By becoming a member at jointhemajorityreport.com, you keep this show alive every single day. It is you people who do this. And we're, we're doing all sorts of fun things coming up. We're going to go to uh, Netroots Nation. We're heading down there to do a couple of interviews uh, next week. I mean, not a couple. Probably do like 40, 20. I have no idea. Um, last year on, at Netroots Nation, I think, uh, interviewed Cynthia Nixon and um, Zephyr Teachout and uh, Shockway Lumumba. Shukwe? Shukwe? Uh, but I like what you said about that there'll be an intellectual resurgence too because I am starting to see a little bit of that. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. The myopia. Hey, listen. 
if somebody is aware that Dave Rubin is in town and he's on Twitter asking people to meet him at a wine bar, that is not the time to just tag me on Twitter. You call me. Say I'm subtweeting me right now. You call me. I saw this at 10.30 last night. I don't care insisting that when I it call was. Him I would have like... Brendan had the perfect tweet. He tweeted at both of us, and he said in Michael's Sam Cedar voice, Hi! <laughs> Which is exactly the right way to let you know. Well, that's fine, but then call me. I would have... I was alone with Saul. Uh, Mile is at camp. And Kids, I you'll be fine. I Daddy's going uptown. Here's some string cheese. <laughs> Do you see? No, it's like, Hi, Saul, Dave. wake up. Wake up. You're coming with Daddy. <laughs> We've got to go somewhere. This is going to be important. He's going to give you a juice box. You'll never, go humiliate ever, him. ever forget this night. You watch your father humiliate a very <laughs> stupid man, son. He's a very dumb man on the Upper West Side. Saul, <laughs> can you hold an iPhone and shoot this video, please? <laughs> We need to post this on YouTube. Yeah. Son, can you say open exchange of ideas? Right. Listen, now, when you we're going to live stream to face, Facebook. <laughs> now, listen, when you start to see all the little bubbles and hearts, that means that people are liking it, and I want you just to respond when you see those. <laughs> um, Hi. But we're going down to uh, Netroots hey, Nation. I don't know how I got on that. Hey, Dave. <clears throat> we're going to be down at Netroots Nation. And uh, for a couple of days. And uh, also, next week, if all goes right, maybe by midweek, we are going to launch uh, something new. And it is, um, I mean, I don't know how many people listen to this point in the show. What percentage? Uh, so, you know, we'll be talking about it at the top of the show more, but it is uh, something that I've always wanted, which was just a very quick rundown of the headlines in the morning that I need to know. So I have a sense of like, you know, what the what the tone of my day is going to be like, but also from a sort of a uh, a, a, a left left leaning perspective. You know, sort of like the show, but um, more it's like, like the, the daily ding of news. I mean, for people Ooh. to listen to that. What's the daily ding? Oh. Well, daily ding is behind a paywall now, but it was um, the Count the Dings Network. It was just like the morning NBA roundup, oh. and it would be like everything you needed to know in it, but also Maybe in that's a way. that's what we call it, the oh. daily ding. I don't care that there's one already. Sure. Made it. Why Maybe not? They're behind a paywall. But it, what is, the other thing that's analogous about it is that you know, it was like a great com. It wasn't just a straight summary. They still had, even though it was short and concise, you know, they're there for their analysis. A little, and little attitude. We don't so have much. There's a little yeah, bit little, of little, little flair. Little attitude. A little, little bit flare. of flair. Uh, the but, info you need with a little bit of flair. Right. And uh, low bar to entry. It's going to be always very short. We're going for brevity in this uh, instance. Little levity, mostly brevity. Good morning, Rebels. <laughs> <laughs> oh, maybe we should How actually we finish it. Oh, that has to be part of the That's opening a package. That's waiting to happen. That is not a lawsuit. Why? Why can't we sample that? He doesn't it's... own the word Rebels. Good morning, no, Patriots. <laughs> Good morning, <laughs> Rebels. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we'll include that type of stuff. <clears throat> I'm trying to do something just that's the old, not too, the too old, inside. Uh, just slow it down or speed it up. Do the old lek technique. Well, there's no, uh, we're not going to be, uh, this will not be available on YouTube uh, at first anyways. And then ultimately, I think we will, we will put a version up on YouTube. Um, all right, <laughs> folks. Yeah, so, he's busy. Uh, he's running for Congress. I mean, he's going to take out is AOC. Is he running for Congress? I don't know. I thought that was what he was threatening. What the, what's he ago. up to? Is he still around? I thought he was going to challenge AOC. I know the latest uh, Brand Straka update, and I haven't watched it yet, which is why I haven't brought it to anybody's attention. And it's literally because of the freaking YouTube algorithm. There are these very silly Vice series where they like to get like, well, let's have a group of like, black people to respond to the democratic debate but some of them will be maga right they like that this is like this new sort of like reality show vice thing mm -hmm. so the new one is like lgbtq with maga and there he is in the center row with oh. his stupid hat on which is actually i mean 
that's probably a dream come true for him. Oh yeah, you know. So well, that was, but whole, I haven't seen it yet. That was I don't probably know. the whole uh, game plan. My guess would be is that it's a bunch of relatively normal people being like, "What are you talking about?" What's while wrong he with this says guy? The same stuff that he said right. to you. Good morning, right. rebels. But it did look kind of promising. So maybe we'll have to dig through that. Maybe we'll have to apathetically steamroll through some of that content at some point. Um. <clears throat> So uh, we're, we're uh, all, all of uh, your membership will will help us um, uh, launch this uh, this little baby as well. Join the majority report dot com. Also, don't forget just coffee dot co op fair trade coffee, tea or chocolate. Use the coupon code majority get 10 percent off. Uh, today is Tuesday, July 2nd. And that means that tonight is Tuesday, July 2nd. Indeed. Right, Michael. Indeed. On tonight's show at. 7 p.m. on the Michael Brooks Show YouTube channel, we are discussing reclaiming the future, technology, and Marxism. Then Anthony Fontano of The Needle Drop comes on. We're talking about the 25-year anniversary of It Was Written and Reggae, and then Malika Jabali organizing for a post-capitalist future, gerrymandering vote suppression and uh, voter turnout, and Biden and Harris, and then a post-game dealing with the 10 year anniversary of the coup in Honduras new interview with Manuel Zelaya, of course the debunk bunch of other content patreon.com slash TMBS Michael Brooks show on YouTube where we're well over 53,000 subscribers now. So we're starting to kind of cook there. And, uh, don't forget, check out, um, the Antifada at patreon.com slash the Antifada. Jamie is at uh, communist uh, commie camp right now. Uh, and an undisclosed, got to have some OPSEC. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Dennis Prager at Commie Camp. Uh, as for the uh, literary hangover, uh, the most recent episode is on a satire of the original utopian socialists in America, The Blythedale Romance by Nathaniel Hawthorne. Coming up next is going to be a contemporary utopian. Uh, I wouldn't call him a socialist, but sort of a liberal leftist. Rutger Bregman's Utopia for Realist. Realists. He's been on this show. We talk. Me and my friend Chris are going to talk about his 15-hour work week proposals, his abolished poverty stuff, uh, and most consequentially his UBI. And uh, we'll also um, take some shots at the Yang Gang uh, in that podcast as well. So look forward to that in the next coming, maybe this weekend, uh, possibly next weekend. We just got uh, tweeted a piece by, I forget his name, uh, the co-author of the People's Republic of Walmart. Um, Michael, Hal Rosworski? Yes, who's really brilliant. And he wrote a piece three years ago, apparently uh, echoing everything we said about UBI. Two different versions. Who did? The co-author of the People's Republic. Mikhail Rosworski? We've co interviewed him a Co-author of People's Republic of Walmart. You oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, well, yeah, I mean, the, uh, it's a, it, it's, it's a fairly, uh, straightforward critique of UBI. It's a political critique. And it's an unfair one. Stop smearing <laughs> Andrew <laughs> Yang. Have him on the show. Why don't you? Do you really think he would really attack people really with disabilities? Think he would attack people with disabilities? That's a smear. Meanwhile, he's thinking about robotics while you're stuck in the past. <laughs> I mean, Automation's got a kick. And your, your robot's gonna take your podcast. And your head's gonna be your dick while you're looking at Chay Flag. Meanwhile, he's thinking about solutions. <laughs> Answer me. And you gotta explain get... why he's bad to poor people. Answer me now. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> See you in the fun half. <laughs> you right. are in for it. All right, folks. Six four six two five seven thirty nine twenty. See you in the fun. Are you ready? <laughs> well, who sent us this? <laughs> alpha males are back. 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 Boy is back. And the alpha males are back. Just as delicious as you can imagine. The alpha males are back, 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 boy, back. And the alpha males are back, 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 back. Just wanna degrade the white man. The alpha males are back, back. I take all of it to my throat. Alpha males are back, 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 back. Almost says what? The alpha males are back, 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 back. You are a madman. 
and the alpha males are back, back, back. I, 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 I am a total cunt. Can we bring back DJ Danner? Yeah, or a couple of them. Just put them in rotation. DJ Denner. Well, the problem with those is they're like 45 seconds long, so I don't know if they're enough of a break. That's fucking nonsense. Hey, folks, fucking reminder. I do not have Parkinson's. And the alpha males are... Psych. Fuck them. Fuck them. Fuck them. Almost says what? What 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 you tried doing an impression on a college campus? I, I think that there's no reason why reasonable people across the divide can't all agree with this. Psych. And the alpha males are back, 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 back. And the Africans are black, 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 black African. And the alpha males are back, 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 back. And the Africans are black, 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 out there, doesn't a little part of you think that America deserves to be taken over by jihadists? Keep it at 100. You can't knock the hustle. Come on! Fuck them! Fuck them! Fuck them! Fuck them! Fuck them! Things I do for the bigger game plan. By the way, it's my birthday! My birthday! Happy birthday to me, Jew boy! I have a thought experiment for you. And the alpha males are back, back. Africans are black, black. Alpha males are back, back. Africans are black. We still got to put out, I think, a day like maybe like on July 4th, where we put out a podcast or a series of them with the songs that people have done so that we can put them on our Spotify account. Obviously, with credit and whatnot, but is that how we would go about doing it? Yeah, just as if they were episodes. Um, <clears throat> that stuff is so great. So great. Let's see here. Where is... There I am. Let me get me in there and then go to the top of the list here. Call him from a 210 area code. Who's this? Who am I speaking with? Where are you from? Yes. Good afternoon, Sam. It's John from San Antonio. John from San Antonio. How are you, sir? I'm okay. Yeah, so the, the most historically accurate and national poll that came out after the Democratic debates, which is the SSRS uh, CNN poll, that has some good news and some bad news. The good news is that Biden has dropped 10 points and is now at 22 points, uh, percentage points. Uh, Harris is at 17, Warren at 15. And the bad news is that Bernie, for the first time, is in fourth place at 14 percent. And the Suffolk uh, poll just dropped also from Iowa uh, just this morning, and uh, it has pretty similar results. Uh, Biden at 24 percent, uh, or yeah, uh, Biden at 24 uh, percent, Harris at 16, Warren at 13, and Bernie just at nine. Uh, so you know they, they also. The, that Suffolk poll also had some really bad results for Bernie in Massachusetts, so I, I really need to go over some cross tabs to evaluate it. But yeah, things aren't aren't looking so great for Bernie right now. Uh, so, so in the in that last poll, that SSRS poll uh, that was conducted in May, Bernie had 26% of the under 45 vote and 10%. Uh, the 45 and older vote, and the latest polling had 25, 21% under 45, uh, with Harris at 18 and Warren at 17, and uh, 45 and older, Bernie is only at 8%. Uh, so before, so he's uh, bleeding he more at young 10. people at this point than he is older people. Is that it? Well, yeah. I mean, he's always been extremely strong with with younger voters. Right. I mean, it was 
much more pronounced uh, during the, the 2016 campaign. So, uh, you know, so they also have this this thing about, you know, uh, regardless of who you support, uh, which Democratic for, uh, you know, who's the best chance to beat Trump in the 2020 election. And, you know, Biden still leads at 43 percent while Bernie's at 13. And so the fact that, Bur- that Biden dropped 10 points overall and he still has massive leads in electability is a good sign that people are starting to make their judgment on issues instead of electability. Uh, considering the lack of pr- predictability this early in the cycle or even in the, when the primary, after the primary start, uh, this should be talked about more. Uh, Clinton actually hit her peak in head-to-head state polling against Trump on May 5th of 2016. Clinton not only had leads in the five states that she ex- was expected to win on Election Day, which she ended up losing Florida, uh, North Carolina, Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania. She also had leads in Arizona, Georgia, M- Missouri, Iowa, uh, Ohio, and even Utah. The only state that Trump had a lead in Wait, uh, what, and what year? What, in, wait a second. What? Um, what? When was this? In May of 2016. Right. That was when she hit her her the head-to-head peak against Trump. So yeah. So now it, it, the only thing is, is that May of 2016. I'll tell you why I don't think it's analogous. Is that in May of 2016, the idea? I don't. I still don't think that people felt that Donald Trump was the nominee. I think probably a lot of Republicans. But convince themselves, I'm not going to vote for Donald Trump. Um, but Republicans come home. I mean, that's the one thing that I would say, you know, uh, probably skewed those polls on some level is that people, even some of the Republicans, didn't realize how craven they were. Well, they supported him in the fall of, of 2015, and then his support uh, vanished as the primaries got on to where they heard more about him. And so these are direct head-to-heads. This isn't based on a generic Republican candidate. This is based on direct uh, head-to-heads. But, you, you know, your point is well taken. I mean, perhaps you're right. I mean, people obviously did change their mind. They changed their mind. I mean, uh, on the 20th of October, uh polls started changing that was that was also the peak in clinton the lead and just you know in two weeks later you know the polls went down right. from uh i added about a 67 percent chance of clinton winning so anyway uh so the the point is is that you know bernie leads the pack as a democratic candidate for president when you talk about health care at 20 percent 26 percent biden is second at, at 18 so this provides an, an opportunity to lean into Medicare for all and talk about the different differences from the other top tier candidates. Three weeks ago in a call, you emphasized idiosyncratic voters, but but there are actually very actually very few of those out there. Most vote on ideology. And you know, as as we see more deep debates, ideology is going to be become more important. Uh, Do you, you, know, you think most people the, vote on ideology? Absolutely. I mean, just look at this latest uh, latest uh, poll from uh, the CNN poll. Conservative slash moderate, uh, Biden has 31 uh, percent right now, uh, Harris at 11, Warren at 10, Sanders with only 8 percent of, of the vote. And you look at liberal and uh, Harris leads at 24 percent. Bernie with 20, Harris with 20, and Biden with 12. And that's going to become more distinct as time goes on. So, uh, uh, I mean, so, I'm uh, not sure. Uh, okay. I mean, I, I think uh, there's probably definitely some sorting. I don't know that most people do it that way. You've just looked at people well, who, I mean, uh, who, who identify, you know, uh, politically in one way or another. But, I mean, if you look at uh, the polling of, like, who are Biden's second choices? Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty skeptical of that second choice thing. I mean, because as time goes on, that's going to move also. I mean, right now, that's, that's more, it's more about people uh, not being familiar with it, uh, the other candidates as much. I mean, also, that's going to change also in head-to-heads when uh, – you know, as as Harris and 
and Warren become more known to the general public, their numbers are going to get better against Trump. I mean, look at all the, the other people that have uh, you know, even less than the top-tier candidates. The reason they're not beating Trump uh, is because they don't know them, and people don't want to say they're going to vote for somebody who they don't know their ideology. So. All right. Uh, so, yeah. So, uh, so, so the considering the the lack of predictability this early in the cycle, or even in after the primaries. Uh, let's see where am I? Uh, so, you know, I love looking at the complexity of issues, but some assessments are derived from from simplicity. I thought at the beginning of the campaign that whether Bernie wins or not will be an assessment of the strength of the left. I still think that. But it looks like Warren and, and Harris are winning potential uh, Boney, Bernie voters. Uh, Bernie wasn't aggressive against Biden or other candidates. This goes against his nature. But, but Harris won the debate by being aggressive. It seems like uh, he needs to point out differences, especially on health care, between him and the other three contenders. Uh, should he do this at the next debate, or does he have t- more time to wait? And what else do you think Bernie needs to do to help his campaign? What I think uh, Bernie needs to do uh, is, and I don't think it's just, I, I mean, I think health care is part of it. But I think broadly what he needs to do is he needs to basically bring out that FDR quote again, saying they're all, you know, uh, I, I, I agree with you, I want to do what you say, and it won't cost a, a nickel, or whatever that quote is by FDR, that it's, it's, gonna, it's not going to cost a thing. And the idea behind that is, is that Bernie needs to get out there. I thought the best moment that he had, or I should say, the moment that I think that can be most effective for him going forward was when they asked him, but you have to raise taxes on Medicare. He hesitated for a moment, but then he said, yes, you do have to raise taxes for everyone. And I think, I think we are in an era, you know, and I think about the time where uh, Mondale said that we have to raise taxes. I can't remember the context, but, but he got completely lambasted for, it, for saying that, and that uh, created in Democrats like a fear of, of, of saying that, Hey, you're going to get this, but it's you know it's going to have to be paid for, you know, in some fashion. Um, and putting aside, you know, what we know about our government's ability to spend these things, this is more about meeting people where their preconceptions lie. I think that Bernie can differentiate himself from the rest of the field by delivering frank truths. And being unafraid to do that and tying that into his capacity or his plan to execute plans. So he can say, um, I can, you know, we can promise you this and we can promise you that, but this is what it's going to cost. This is not going to be free. It's going to cost in some fashion. And I think he, if the, the more he's up front about saying what the cost is and the more he's up front about oh. saying this is not going to happen without you, the more that he turns it on to, um, you know, points uh, basically the questions back at um, us, you know, I mean, it's some variation of, you know, ask not what you can, you know, what your country can do for you, but ask what you can do for your country. I think there's I think that's got to be part of it because I mean he's been sort of, you know, around that message where he talks about the idea of there needing to be a movement. He calls it a political revolution. But what he really means is where the citizenry comes in and gets active about demanding things from their political system instead of just going and voting, that they actually get engaged and demand things from their political system. And I think he needs to hit this more. And I think he needs to be frank about it and say, like, this is going to cost you. It's going to cost you time and effort. In some instances, it's going to cost you uh, increased taxes. But there's going to be a payoff. 
And the payoff is going to be, you're going to have a much better healthcare system for everyone. You're going to live in a society that is going to decommodify certain elements that are crucial to all of us living a better life. Some of the returns on this are going to be, you're going to have opportunities and these opportunities are going to be shared by the people that you see when you drive to work and when you walk to work or when you take the, the bus to work, they're going to be shared across the country. And these are opportunities that everyone's going to be able to engage in. And it's going to create a better society. It's going to create a more, in some respects, a more cohesive society insofar as that we, we understand that we're more connected with each other. It's going to make for a more healthy society. Uh, it's going to make for a society that can act upon crises like what's happening with the climate. And, but it's going to cost you. And I think it's really important for him to come out and make that clear, that he is asking something of us. And right. because that is what distinguishes him from frankly, all of the politicians. I mean, I'm quite enamored with a lot of the things that uh, Elizabeth Warren wants to do, but the way in which it gets done, Bernie has a fundamentally different perspective on how that's going to have to happen. And I think he's got to sell that. I think he does also need to couple it with a lot of doses of how much significantly better life will be after some of those efforts are passed as well, and that there's no complexity around it. I think that's a big advantage. Like... We're just canceling student debt. It's not a new program. It's not something people need to fill out forms for. We're just doing it. It's simple. It's effective. It's bold. It's really clear. Costs about he, as much as the Republican tax cuts. Costs but, about but as much. I think thing, he's also I, he needs he needs you can't you know you sugar with the medicine as well. I also think like but but I here's he the thing. Needs the, I think people understand that that's his position. No, but I, I think th the thing is is that people don't believe it can happen. Well, that's the element and, where of just purely talking about this movement dimension that he talks about really needs to kick in. And I think he, well, that's you know, people, what I'm saying. Right. And I think that people do need to know, you know, frankly, as a significant differentiation with Warren, that now that when push comes to shove, she rightly recognizes that to even push a more limited agenda would take basically the same type of effort. So that this sort of notion that somehow there's a technical plan dominated option over a movement option doesn't actually exist. And so that she's actually making the same argument and that the difference is, is that he actually has this movement in place. And the only other thing that I think is interesting, I'm not somebody who thinks like, oh, polls don't measure all of these, like, you know, people who are going to secretly vote or something. I, I, I'm, I would never hinge my hopes on that. But something that interesting that Ryan Grimm said to me uh, recently was basically like, if, as an example, in a place like Iowa, if the Sanders campaign is being honest about their level of volunteers and people that are actually canvassing for them, you start to get into a place definitionally where you win something like the Iowa caucuses just on pure body mass alone. So that's another interesting thing that's going to need to be measured uh, in terms of in terms of their campaign, but well, we don't we don't know. We yet. won't know that till Iowa. No, we don't know. We don't know that. But that's but the difference, and this is another interesting thing I'm taking from Grimm, which is that you know he made the point that 2016, the really untraditional things were obviously the message and Bernie's politics are you know unprecedented in in modern politics, and then the way that they relied on small donors. But besides that, it was a very traditional campaign. You dump money into television. You focus on the early states. In this campaign, they've made the choice to really go grassroots. I mean, that's the reason they're using their email list for right. all of these other efforts. So, you know, and that's like the part that I think is a gamble and an interesting thing that won't necessarily get measured by the traditional metrics. Not like, oh, there's all these secret voters that aren't showing up, but really like, is there an amplified version of even what we're seeing with things like the Tiffany Caban race or other things here. Like if you really put people out door to door, that makes a hell of a difference. And if they're actually leveraging that, that could be a big difference maker. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I mean, I think that's, that's, that's true. I, but it's, it's really hard to know until the actual, um, you know, results, which come is in. another way of saying that all of this is still super early. <laughs> Well, right? but I even mean, I mean, know, look, this is all super early. I think we'll have a we, better sense of even that a couple of months before. I don't obviously. think it's. I, I. I'm not. I'm not questioning uh, Grimm's perspective on this. 
But we all were saying in October of 2016, like, Clinton's just going to kill him with a ground game. He doesn't have a ground game. And that, that didn't work out um, because it turns out there wasn't a ground game. Well, we um, know that he had. I mean, that's that's. Yeah. I mean, I'm not I, I saying would, it's at the scale. I would but imagine we know that those two things are not alike. Yes. I'm just saying, though, that it's one never knows. But that's my my perspective on what he's got to do. And I suspect that he's going to do some variant of that uh, going forward. Appreciate the call, John. All right. Thank you. Right. And it's but I think there is I mean, I think it is working very effectively. And I think it's an incredible lesson for this next generation, the the seamlessness between the grassroots emphasis using the email list for the ice alerts, for solidarity with strikes, and then the way they have, you know, this this separate grassroots media arm. I mean, I forget the author's name. I think you had him on recently. If somebody writes for the Jacobin on teacher strikes, they just he just did a video Blanc, for Bernie. Eric yeah, Blanc. Blanc just did a video for Bernie's campaign encouraging teacher strikes it has very little to do you know it's it's right. an ancillary thing it's gotten some massive amount of views and i i think that hopefully it will work with bernie of course but i mean this is also the model for all future left candidates of how you run a mo an actual movement campaign well, that synchronizes it, it, these things it, it it is if he wins um it oh, is I mean, it's a model look <clears throat> no because you even see hints of this with the success of people like caban for sure i mean this is the way you actually link campaigns with movements in a way that's right. tangible and not just lip service right. and left candidates are going to need to do that right i also think that it is um bernie saying that one it is quite possible that the calculation is this is going to help uh, build uh, strength and for my movement to get elected. Uh, or, and it's also possible my campaign is going to help build a uh, movement that is going to exist regardless of whether my campaign is successful in this instance. I feel like he's already proven that in a way. I mean, we've already he's already established that post-2016, there's a, there's a but whole that's another one. set we'll of resources see. that you have as a campaign that you do not have as a sitting senator. Sure. Uh, or uh, or a congressman or in any other industry. Well, so when you asked him that question when you had him on, by the way, second time he's been on this show, other uh, certain other YouTuber. Oh, he's but, been on more than. No, I'm talking about the current iteration of this show. I think he's been on three times. Oh, really? Oh, well, OK. Three times. But so, that's just but because we don't have politicians on. He lit up uh, he, he when you asked him about the durability of the movement. He said, oh, like, that's right, a right. good, finally, <laughs> yeah. you ask a good question, you little prick. No, um, I was thinking particularly. I know the, what you were thinking, yeah. and that's why. I hope you fucking lose. Um, <laughs> honestly, like, that is a, would be the reaction. All right, let's take one more uh, quick phone call before we get to uh, some more uh, sound. Calling from a 702 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Hey, Sam. Yeah? Hey, what's up, man? What's up? Call from Las Vegas. And your name is? Joseph. Joseph from Las Vegas. What's happening, Joseph? Hey, I had a question. It's a, it's a experimental idea, if, uh, if you would uh, humor me. Sure. So this whole... Um, UBI talk, how popular that's getting. I had a thought that what if to match um, minimum wage, if the government subsidized that instead of employer, instead of doing a UBI, what do you think of the government matching that for employees? I get the idea that uh, corporations should match or should raise the minimum wage so employees have uh, a decent living wage. But what if uh, the government did that? Because I think possibly small businesses wouldn't survive. So wait, wait, wait. So you're saying subsidize, the government should subsidize um, uh, minim, uh, raising the minimum wage? Yes. Yeah. Um, 
I, I mean, I, I don't know if there's a, a problem with it sort of just, I mean, I don't, I don't have a problem obviously in principle, but it, but I, I wonder if you're not talking about just a tremendous amount of bureaucracy. I mean, the, so the EITC, like, you know, it's the earned income tax credit is really in many respects. That's what that is. And it subsidizes companies oh, abusing work. I mean, underpaying workers. I mean, that's a problem. Well, you could say you could you could make it like we're only going to limit it to uh, people who you work know, at small businesses. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Businesses yeah, that yeah, yeah. hire five people or less. But as or it functions now, it's been a major boon for companies like Walmart, which is a rallied critique of it. The that's the earned income tax credit is basically what it is uh, that you're talking about. I don't know if it functions exactly in that way and brings you up to that amount, but it, but that's the vehicle that's used. You could make that more generous, I guess. Um, and in many respects, that is for the what seven seventy five minimum wage or whatever it is for eight twenty five. I'm sorry. Say again. Is that only to match up to the eight twenty five? Uh, an well, hour I rate? don't think it's based on. It's not. It's not based on the minimum wage. Uh, it is. It is simply. I think, and I don't have the numbers in front of me. But if you earn uh, X amount of dollars. And you have a uh, Y amount of people in your family, uh, you may be eligible essentially for a for a tax credit that that may have the government paying you money back. Okay. All right. I'm not an economist, so I just well, you don't have to be an economist. I mean, I think uh, to to you know to make these type of assessments. If I you're mean, not an economist. The, don't call my there, show, sir. There's a there's a vehicle to do that. <laughs> I mean, and I don't know if I would do it through the earned income uh, tax credit or, uh, but that, that's been, and that was a Republican idea that's been actually rather effective as far as these things go. Um, but I appreciate the call. Yes, sir. Have a good one. Uh, all right. So let's let's talk a little bit more about the border, and then we'll move on to some other stuff here. Um, the the ProPublica piece that came out, and I'll tell you what's also disturbing about this. Now, apparently, the um, Customs Border uh, Protection Service, and I'm not exactly sure if it's DHS uh, or just the um, Inspector General for, for ICE or whomever it is, has started an investigation into this. But, man, their controls are pretty lax. You've got a 20,000-person force. You've got supervisors involved in this. There's a 20,000-person force. There are 9,500 people on the group. I guess it's conceivable there's only like a dozen actual border agents there and the rest of them are just sort of civilians who just happen to stumble into the group and it's been going on for 20, since 2016 and nobody, um, nobody caught wind of this. I mean, I don't know how public this is if you need to be invited to this group. It was a secret group, so but I mean, 9,000 members... Start to lose some secrecy there. Yeah, one would imagine, unless you were all part of an organization or part of like you know going to the same picnics, you know, if it, unless you had a little more controls in real life. Now I don't know. We don't know because obviously ProPublica didn't get access into it. But the idea that three years later, the agency is only starting an investigation only because ProPublica let them know about it. That indicates to me that there might be a problem in that, you know, this is not a group of 50 people out of a 20,000 uh, person um, agency. We don't know how many of those 9,500 are a part of the 20,000 that are there, but this is, this is, has, if there's a significant portion, if you have 5%, which would be a thousand people, Members of your agency in this group that is like, I assume it's not a star chamber situation. It's just a place where they go around and say like, hey, good thing that guy died. 
Um, that's a real problem. So, in one exchange, according to ProPublica, group members responded with indifference and wisecracks to the post of a news story about a 16-year-old Guatemalan migrant who died in May while in custody at Border Patrol Station in Texas. The group is called 1015. I'm 1015 and boasts uh, 9,500 9, members from across the country. 1015 is Border Patrol code for aliens in custody. The group described itself in an online introduction as a forum for funny and serious discussion about work with the patrol. Quote, remember, you are never alone in this family. Uh, <clears throat> they found some, like I say, they were able to identify maybe half a dozen people. There is a screenshot from the Facebook group uh, that has a picture of Donald Trump presumably forcing AOC oh. to service him with the text. That's right, bitches. The masses have spoken. And today, democracy won. I've returned to everyone who knows the, the real me. And had my back, I say thank you to everyone else. This is what I have to say. So this is somebody who's, sounds like somebody got banned and maybe has returned to the group. I'm not quite is that sure. What it is? Yeah. Um, you don't think that's somebody who had to testify anywhere, do you? I don't know. It sounds like something though, right? It absolutely Today, does. Democracy won. Maybe they, maybe they were, uh, I don't know, investigated for something. Um You'll recall, according to ProPublica, in 2018, federal investigators found a raft of disturbing and racist text messages sent by Border Patrol agents in southern Arizona after searching the phone of an agent charged with running down a Guatemalan migrant with an F-150 pickup truck. The texts, uh, which were revealed in court file in federal court in Tucson, Arizona, described migrants as guats, wild-ass shitbags, beaners, and subhuman. Messages included repeated discussions about burning the migrants up. Uh, one member in this group, Facebook, encouraged Border Patrol agents to hurl a burrito at these bitches. Speaking of the Congressional Hispanic Caucus that was headed down for this tour that uh, took place yesterday. Another, by a guy who was apparently a patrol supervisor, wrote, Fuck the hose. There should be no photo ops for these scum buckets. Posted a third member. There was also um, a uh, post including a photo illustration of Ocasio-Cortez engaged in oral sex at an immigrant detention center. The accompanying image reads, Lucky Illegal Immigrant, Glory Hole Special, starring AOC. Um, all this stuff. And uh, one saying um, that the floaters... This one's uh, also... With the picture of the 25-year-old man and her his 23-month-old daughter dead, floating in the river... Uh, hey, y'all ever uh, seen floaters this clean? I'm not trying to be an ass, but I have never seen floaters like these before. Uh, could this be another edited photo? We've all seen the Dems and liberal parties do some pretty sick things. So this is the whole, I mean, from the grotesqueness and the misogyny to the conspiracy theory stuff, I mean, this, I mean, this to me like, is where the whole conversation around like fascism actually needs to go, right? Like this stuff really matters. I mean, this is, to me, this is also parallel with the case of the Black Lives Matter activist who uh, had spent time in prison in part due to law enforcement officers following up an Alex Jones segment. Yep. I mean, this is the intersection that is profoundly threatened. Right, and you know, that again, mentioned this before we went into the fun half, but as per the, uh, the guess we had today, that there may be some type of, um, preexisting psychological bias that we all have that these, that many of these, um, 
people posting in this Facebook group have. But when the president of the United States basically gives you a license to articulate this stuff, you start to articulate it. When others give you more encouragement, maybe perhaps you run somebody over with your F-150 because you continually dehumanize these people. That's right. AOC uh, went down there. She uh, she said uh, consumer, uh, the uh, CBP, excuse me, the um, Customs Border Patrol made us check our phones, but one woman slipped me this packet to take with me. It says shampoo. She told me that this is all they give the women to wash their entire body, nothing else. Some woman's hair was falling out. Others had gone 15 days without taking a shower. Here is another image uh, that she put out. She writes, uh, meanwhile, one refrain we've heard is that people are overcrowded in the custom border patrol concentration camps because the shelters, which are humane places where families can stay together, are full. So we went to a shelter. They said that wasn't true at all. Only 150 of 500 spots were filled. Weird CBP line. Well, that's the point. They are trying to make a crisis. They are using these human beings, these children, to create a crisis. One, to ostensibly to scare, I guess, people from coming up here. But I'm also not convinced at this point the theory is it's a twofer or a threefer. All of which boils down to what Donald Trump thinks he's going to run on in 2020 because he ran on it in 2016. And it's the one thing that this administration, to the extent that they've had a coherent policy about anything, it has been to demonize immigrants. It's the one promise he's kept. It's the one uh, one promise he's kept. It's the one coherent sort of policy apparatus that they have had. It is... um, it's the Maybe one it's attributable to Stephen Miller, but whatever it is, this is the one that the Laura Ingrams and the Tucker Carlsons and they all and the Sean Hannity, they all agree on this. They can they can differ on whether we should attack Iran. They can differ whether we should be putting uh, random tariffs on different places. The one thing they all agree on is that you demonize the brown immigrants, period, end of story. And they have done that, and they've done it in a myriad of different ways. They continually do it. They do it for uh, political gain. They do it for policy gain from their perspective. And that's what's happening. Here is AOC on the ground um, touring this facility. In that facility. I was not safe from the officers in that facility. Do you have any comment about what was posted about you in the alleged Facebook group? I mean, I think it's just a, it's it's just indicative of of the violent culture that we saw on the inside. So uh, she went in there, and apparently it wasn't just the the postings of these people, but the there were guards there who were being aggressive towards her. And, um, but I think she's right. I mean, look, you know, you've all heard the, uh, the saying one bad apple does not spoil the whole bunch. Well, the fact of the matter is one bad apple does in fact uh, spoil, uh, spoil the whole bunch. Ethylene, you have a rotting apple in a bunch of other apples. That's why you should not keep them in tight plastic bags, folks, in your refrigerator. Let them breathe. Because if you have one apple that has gone bad, the ethylene that is emitted from a rotting apple will seek out other apples. This bacteria will look for healthy apples. So the fact is, one bad apple does in fact spoil the whole bunch. And we have clearly a multitude of bad apples in this organization. It needs to be essentially taken down dispersed, recreated to function in a different way with different personnel and a different culture. Here, is, here she is again. This one. 
This is this is CBP on their best behavior, telling people to drink out of the toilet. Well, what's your response to that, sir? Uh, as I said earlier, we, we don't treat people that way. We provide fresh water. We provide food. Um, we provide sanitary and, and sanitary items as well as uh, um, items for bathing and personal hygiene. And that's are you saying that she's lying? I'm, I'm telling you what we do. And we've been open and honest. We've had these tours quite frequently. And those are the things we provide. We have fresh water available at all times in our facilities. Before well, he's definitely not saying she's lying. Um, why would these people be lying? I mean, what possibly could be gained by if you are kept as a prisoner in one of these outfits? You know, what what value could you possibly have in lying? Here is um, what is this clip of right there? This is a, a clip posted by Joaquin Castro. Uh, OK, inside so one of the here's Joaquin Castro. He was able maybe he smuggled in his phone because my understanding is they took their phones. Which is a really weird thing to do if things are going well in there. Yeah. Right? Yes. They said that they changed her medicine. So uh, the updated medicine, which uh -huh. I'm not going to uh -huh. break her patient confidentiality, but the updated medicine, I just looked at her medical record, was administered for another dose for another time. Uh, 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 so basically you have all, so basically you have all of these women who are in this um, windowless cell um, telling the Congress people there I need my medication I need a biopsy and uh, the person walking them around going, oh, actually, no, she's not due for her medicine. And um, yeah, we're going to get that biopsy. That's going to happen. Um, some of these women have been held for 50 days in this uh, cell. They have been denied showers for up to 15 days. And some of them are separated from their children. It's just disgusting. It's absolutely disgusting. And I, I just want to say, like, again, I think it's really important to keep reemphasizing this point. We talk about destroying ICE, which it absolutely needs to be destroyed. And all of the contractors and everything part of this system needs to be completely uprooted. We're talking about something that was created in 2002 as part of the Homeland Security Department, as part of, you know, First, an agency that set its sights as the national securitization focus of every single Muslim in this country, and then has been weaponized, obviously, against, I mean, people from Latin America, but also Haitian people, a lot, you know, a lot of people in this situation. And getting rid of it completely has nothing to do with saying that there isn't a border and there isn't passport checks. Or, I, you know, I just think it's quite important to actually make sure to be clear and unequivocal that that organization can be completely destroyed and jettisoned in a way that is absolutely fundamentally necessary and humane and actually does not have the broader stakes and debates about like whether or not we have a border which a lot of people seem to want to have and maybe that's fine we can't have it at some point but this is urgent and needs to happen as soon as possible and is a new thing ice is a modern right. creation it hasn't always been this militarized Calling from a uh, 402 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? 402. Who's this? Hi, uh, my name is Lindy from Nebraska. Lindy from Nebraska. Uh, What's on I your got mind? A, hey, 
I got a kick out of watching uh, Sam. Uh, you were getting a little bit defensive about uh, your leftism relative to Michael's last Friday. I'm get, well, I wasn't getting get, a little nervous. I wasn't but, getting defensive, uh, but uh, it's not true. He built yeah, it. I was just. I had just done. Um, that led me call? to watch the startups. Uh, Destiny. Uh, oh where yeah. Destiny okay. asked about rental policy, and a bit about, more about me. I've been involved in the local DSA for about a year now. And uh, one second. So uh, I. I um, I'm kind of new to some of the logic behind specific issues. So uh, since logic man Ben Burgess isn't here, uh, maybe you can give me an argument instead. So uh, a little bit sharpen my rhetoric. So my question is, uh, can you uh, flesh out uh, your support for uh, like rental controls? And what is the response to studies that show benefits are offset by the decrease in or a decrease in the supply of housing and uh, economic distortions? Do the rent controls and uh, yeah. So thank you. Okay. Uh, so so here, wait a second. So, so the the you, you want me to justify my position in favor of rent of rent control? Well, just the the response. I'm not saying I'm against them. I'm just saying what like can you flesh out that argument? I don't. I don't have the data to be honest with you in front of me uh, in terms of like that that. Okay. That trade-off between um, uh, availability and what would theoretically happen in the context of a market, but I can tell you, um, in the, you know, New York City, for instance, and I don't know that rent control okay. is n- really, frankly, necessary in um, in every city. I think there are circumstances right. where I think it becomes New York City is a prime example. I think of a place that needs rent control because you have. Um, it's one thing to say that housing has been commodified. It's another to say that it has become almost like, um, a a collectible. And one of the, the problems with New York is that so much of the real estate here has, is, has, I am, I imagine there is a threshold where the purchase of real estate certain percentage of it becomes so speculative that uh, in terms of its use, like it's, it's so much is sitting vacant uh, in this city or is used frankly as, you know, um, revenue generating as right. basically illicit hotels via Airbnb. Um, those yeah. are the indicators, I think, where something like rent control becomes uh, that much more important, where you simply cannot use a um, – take something that is such a, a basic so human need and um, exploit it to that extent with the um, – with the the results, with the implications that, that that come from that. In other words, you know, people getting dr- uh, driven out of the city, but a huge percentage of the apartments are vacant because they end up being basically like um, what do you call it? safety deposit boxes that have pay interest. I mean, they're basically used as banks, and and I'm not convinced yeah, a lot of that money isn't illicit uh, uh, to a certain extent as well. But I I would also look into in addition to I mean I. I do support universal rent control, but this is another reason that we need to have a really different conversation about public housing. I mean, in the United States, because of not having a full social democracy and because of racism, because of redlining, and, you know, we think of public housing as as being bad. In fact, it is. It's a crisis. I mean, that's one of the reasons I have a big problem with de Blasio. I mean, NYSHA has a lot of problems, as an example, in New York City, and a lot more needs to be done about it. But... Uh, you know, in a place like Vienna, which is always the standout example, the public housing they have there is incredible. It's comparable to any of the most desirable places you want to live. And sort of in some ways, the way even like if you have a public option in the healthcare market, that also plays a positive role in reducing uh, the overall rent environment. So that's another important thing. What was the thing that Destiny said that he wanted to debate Michael on? Uh, unions and uh, uh, climate, I think that was no. at least, well. That was what he had responded to. I can't me. remember what he uh, said in the thing. Am I still here? Yeah, you are. Oh yeah. Uh, Good the, day, the whole sir. thing, uh, Destiny, uh, was 
the whole reason he raised that, I think, is because he he was trying to see if he could uh, relate to you, kind of, because he gets a lot of heat from his leftist followers like me, and uh, that that kind of um, that kind of that's that's where he went down that road. So I thought that was kind of an interesting dynamic. Just and the 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 study was uh, Rebecca Diamond. Uh, it was like a 2017 study that I looked at. I mean. All the other stuff is from like right wing uh, BS, so I, I just didn't know what the argument against that was. So that's all. That's all I called for. All right, so appreciate thank you for the call. taking my call. So thanks. Thank you. Bye. Right. Um, you know, people don't give uh, Donald Trump. Uh, we we talk about housing. People don't give Donald Trump uh, credit at all for uh, the work that he's done in dealing with the homelessness. Um, uh, with homeless people who, who don't have any uh, housing whatsoever. And um, apparently it was a super easy fix. Uh, people don't know about it because he just hasn't had the chance to tell them. I know who can tell them, though. Well, who could we get to maybe um, ask him some very insightful, uh, uh, you know, insightful and uh, incisive questions? Oh, maybe Tucker Carlson. Come to where we are now, Osaka or Tokyo, and the cities are clean. There's no graffiti, no one going to the bathroom on the street. You don't see junkies. It's very nice, isn't it? Very different from our cities. Yep. Well, is, no, some of our cities. Some are of right, our but, cities, but New York City, San Francisco, Los Angeles, they, they've got a major problem with. It's very sad. With filth. Very sad. Why is that? Uh, it's a phenomenon that started two years ago. It's disgraceful. I'm going to maybe. And I'm looking at it very seriously. We're doing some other things, as you probably noticed, like some of the very important things that we're doing now. But we're looking at it very seriously because you can't do that. You can't have what's happening where police officers are getting sick just by walking the beat. I mean, they're getting actually very sick. Uh, where people are getting sick, where the people living there are living in hell, too. Although some of them have mental problems where they don't even know they're living that way. In fact, perhaps... What happened? So it started two years ago, I, but the world is a scene from Death Wish in the seventies. I, I what is he talking I about? I don't know. It's really hard. And I mean, Tucker with that cleanliness shit. I mean, jeez. To me, the cleanliness I wonder if it's talk, because maybe they pay their public workers. Uh, they hire enough people to clean up the. This is a theory. I, I think it was actually Thomas Friedman who wrote in the 90s that Japan was going to stop needing to have jobs like that in a global economy. Why? Because who would they bring in too other much, people? Too much bureaucracy. Well, so know, who would do not, it? Well, you, I don't, machines. Oh, I see. more people. I don't All know. right, so let's pick it up. For, let, let's play through that again because I'm trying to figure out what he's saying. I think that my guess is this. Trump, what he thinks of cities, the only city he knows is New York. Right. He doesn't go outside. He hasn't been outside in a city. God knows when. So he's thinking New York. And of course, he's thinking New York in the 70s or 80s. And so when he says it started two years ago, I think that's a reference to maybe the stopping of stop and frisk. Oh, yeah. Maybe. Right. And I think that, that that's that makes sense. I mean, this, I'm just Bill trying to bless really you. Trying to him a bit too much credit there. I'm trying to decipher this. And, yeah, but the one thing he could he be giving, the but the reverse. one time that Trump knows something, it would be like, uh, I'm in a complete flog, but but there was something when we stopped doing something racist to cause problems. I remember it. That's a specific. I got it. I don't know if he's saying that things started to get dirty two years ago. If things started to get clean two years ago, it's completely, uh, who knows? Come to where we are now, Osaka or Tokyo, and the cities are clean. There's no graffiti no one going to the bathroom on the street. You don't see junkies. It's very nice, isn't it? Very different from our cities. Yep. Well, Why is no, some of our cities. Some are of right, our but cities. But New York City, San Francisco, Los Angeles, they, they've got a major problem with... It's very sad. With filth. Very sad. Why is that? Uh, it's a phenomenon that started two years ago. It's disgraceful. I'm going to maybe... And I'm looking at it very seriously. We're doing some other things, as you probably noticed, like some of the very important things that we're doing now. But we're looking at it very seriously because you can't do that. You can't have what's happening where police officers are getting sick just by walking the beat. I mean, they're getting actually very sick uh, where people are getting sick, where the people living there are living in hell, too. Although some of them have 
mental problems where they don't even know they're living that way. In fact, perhaps they like living that way. Uh, they can't do that. You, we cannot ruin our cities. And you have people that work in those cities. They work in office buildings, and to get into the building, they have to walk through a scene that nobody would have believed possible three years ago. And this is the liberal establishment. This is what I'm fighting. They, I don't know if they're afraid of votes. I don't know if they really believe that this should be taking place. But it's a terrible thing that's taking place. And we may be... You know, I had a situation when I first became president. We had certain areas of Washington, D.C., where that was starting to happen. And I ended it very quickly. I said, you can't do that. When we have leaders of the world coming in to see the president of the United States and they're riding down a highway, they can't be looking at that. I really believe that it hurts our country. They can't be looking at scenes like you see in Los Angeles and San Francisco. San Francisco, I own property in San Francisco, so I don't care, except it was so beautiful. And now areas that you used to think as being, you know, really something very special, you take a look at what's going on with San Francisco. It's terrible. So uh, we're looking at it very seriously. We may intercede. We may uh, do something to uh, get that whole thing cleaned up. It's inappropriate. Now, we have to take the people and do something. We have to do something. Right. Right. So in other words, uh, I think what President Trump is announcing is a federal program to round up the homeless and do something with them. Uh, he's going to federalize this problem. Of course, that would be the only way that he could do it in San Francisco and Washington and New York and all these major Washington. cities. Um, also, I don't know if there is, I don't know what the specifics are for a Polk Award or a Pulitzer or any type of journalism, but if there's one for um, keeping a straight face, and not saying to the person you're interviewing, what the hell are you talking about? Then I guess Tucker Carlson should get that one. Because um, I, it was 90% of that, I am sorry. There's no one in the world who knows what he's talking about. I don't know if he does. Maybe he does, and he's just using some type of shorthand. But this hadn't started until three years ago. Uh, it's bizarre. By solving it in D.C., I think he means, like, I instructed Secret Service to make sure I never see a homeless person in the motorcade. Right. Let's I drive a different way or put new uh, one-way windows looking in, not out. Can we just have an uh, ice cream truck that follows to the right of the car so I don't have to look at any of the homeless people? I remember in, uh, in Trinidad, somebody said, oh, the ride from the airport to Port of uh, Spain there used to be these like homeless encampments and shanty towns. And I was like, Oh, I don't see them. It's they've been, and they were like, Oh yeah, they all literally got built over before, uh, the America summit that Obama went to in 2009. Sure. They'll just come right yeah, in. Let's do that. That's a great model. Well, that That's also what happened yes. during the Olympics in right. uh, most places. Olympics everywhere. The Olympics goes. Yes. Uh, here's Donald Trump reacting to the Supreme court saying, Hey, um, the DOJ lied to us and the Commerce Department lied to us about their reasons for including a question on citizenship in the census. They left the door open to the idea that DOJ or Commerce could come back and give another justification for it. But it seems really hard to believe that a grown up could rule that this is a legitimate response when they had made a point of saying, no, there's only one reason why we're doing this. And um, it turns out with the exposure of documents that came from a Republican operative that they were lying about that. It's hard to imagine the Supreme Court doing that, but it's also from a timing perspective, very hard to imagine because the 2020 census is I think scheduled to go out in October, they're going to start to do the counting because it takes several months. Um, so I don't know what you could do to foreclose the uh, or to reopen the question of literally the question of what citizenship you have. Here's Donald Trump, though, coming up with another idea. Um, will you be delaying the census, Mr. President? Where? Will you be delaying the census? Uh, the Supreme Court the yeah, we're looking at that. Uh, we think that a census, obviously, 
if, if you do all of this work, and you're talking about nobody can believe this, but they spend billions of dollars on the census, and you're not allowed to ask, you don't knock on doors of houses, check houses, you go through all this detail, and you're not allowed to ask whether or not somebody is a citizen, so you can ask other things, but you can't ask whether or not somebody's a citizen. So we are trying to do that. We're looking at that very strongly. And why, oh, I'm sorry, if I could follow up. Why do you think it's so important that that question be asked? I think it's very important to find out if somebody's a citizen as opposed to an illegal. I think that there's a big difference to me between being a citizen of the United States and being an illegal. And you know, the Democrats want to treat the illegals with health care and with other things better than they treat the citizens of our country. If you look at a coal miner that has black lung disease, you're talking about people that get treated better than the coal miner. And these people got sick working for the United States, and we treated people that just walked in better. You look at what they're doing in California, how they're treating people. They don't treat their people as well as they treat illegal immigrants. So at what point does it stop? It's crazy what they're doing. It's crazy. And it's mean. And it's very unfair to our citizens. And we're going to stop it. But we may need an election to stop it. And we may need to get back the House. Okay, so I want to show you folks something that's really interesting about this. I guarantee you, I will bet you everything I own, that if this case returns to any court, and the DOJ comes in and says, oh, the real reason we need to ask this question is because uh, we have another provision of the Voting Rights Act that we want to uh, promote. The opposing attorneys are going to say, here is exhibit, well, we know what exhibit A was. That was the documents that we found on the hard drives of the godfather of the gerrymandering. Here's exhibit B. The president of the United States, when asked, why do you need this question on there? It had nothing to do with the Voting Rights Act. He didn't say a word about it. All he said was, it's bad the way that uh, anybody's giving benefits to immigrants. Guess what? The census is a constitutionally mandated count of every person in the United States. When the Constitution enumerates a specific role for government and a specific task, anything that you do that in any way can be seen and construed as inhibiting the efficacy of that task must uh, uh, attain a certain high standard before the court will allow that thing to go forward. And so, Donald Trump, thank you for protecting our senses by being such an incredibly racist blowhard. I don't know and that he has... black lung disease advocate? I mean, that guy gutted funding right. for black lung disease. Wall, in fact, in an, another one of his plays, you know... Uh, speaking to misdirected frustration in West Virginia, which does have like an almost, you know, colonial extraction status inside the United States with those industry industries and a huge public health problems, including that guy who uh, ran for Senate himself and brought us cocaine Mitch who should be in prison. But just the, I mean, if it's Trump, so whatever, it's not a surprise, but it's like, I love how he reaches for the one example of like, Oh, you mean the program that you lied about and cut? Right. Okay. All right. We cut that? That's how I remembered it. <laughs> that was a good lie. So, uh, Brian Kilmeade, he really seems to be poking up the uh, yeoman's amount of work. Uh, what's his face? Uh, Steve Ducey seems to have basically checked out. He seems like I'm no longer... He doesn't uh, have Roger Ailes to guide him anymore. Yeah, I He's a I'm lost not, man. I don't know who I'm supposed to, what I'm supposed to say. And Kilmeade... Uh, I think it's stepping up. He feels like he's going to be the next generation. He's, I think he's been on the radio quite a bit as of late, so he's really getting excited. And uh, here he is again trying to, um, try, trying to basically justify the incredibly um, inhumane treatment of immigrants in these concentration camps AOC has shown that uh, with uh, on her trip down there, that at very least, 
at one family detention center where they could have housed people. There were 350 beds out of 500 that were available. That is not what this administration is interested in. But um, here is Ryan Kilmeade trying to um, carry some water. But as always, he's got a bucket full of holes. Okay, here's the thing. Picture yourself, uh, you have a, a house, family of five, you have a party, you have 30 people over, maybe you have a big party, you have 100 people over, and you have two and a half baths. In the beginning, uh, it would be okay with 30. Then after 100 people, it would be a little bit taxed. Maybe you got to get outdoor facility. Can you picture 5,000? You could have the best facilities in the world, but they are so overstocked. 670,000 have come here illegally already. They had 89,000 last month. The month before, 130,000 coming illegally. They have facilities that hold hundreds, not tens of thousands. And now you're going to walk down there with the facilities that they gave, that they're not pulling out of their pocket, their uniforms you gave them, and say the facilities are not right. They've been pleading for help. Kevin McElhaney, his predecessor, have been begging for help for months. It took a July. July 1st, last minute, Hail Mary, just to get me a humanitarian aid, put the border wall aside. So you did, if you don't watch Fox, that's fine. Did you watch 60 Minutes? They did this whole feature already, yeah. how bad it was, how the Border Patrol has got to change diapers and provide material, how the, how the National Guard got to take over for the Border Patrol behind the desk so the press agents can go back there and pick up illegals and bring in the facilities that are overcrowded. They can't build tents fast enough. It wasn't their idea to have a wide open border. It was bad uh, asylum rules that allowed this to happen, and then you throw it all on the Border Patrol and you wonder why facilities aren't adequate. Well, that's well, I mean, first off, the asylum rules have gotten narrower, not wider, under the Trump administration. The number of people eligible for asylum in this country have shrunk, not expanded. So the apt analogy would be, imagine you had a house, five people living in the house, two bathrooms, you invite over 30 people for the party, and then you tell them, uh, we're only inviting 30 people at a time, but none of you can leave. And we're going to, um, we're going to put uh, cops out there who are going to give tickets to anybody who pulls up with a car with anything that even reeks slightly of a violation. But we're going to allow more people to come in. So here's 60 people, 90 people, 100 people. The reason why these facilities are getting over... Uh, overcrowded is because they're not allowing families to pick up their kids or their cousins or their nephews or nieces. They're separating parents from children. They're not allowing them to go in the community to basically be what on, uh, what, what is like on more or less on bail. We know something like 80, 80 to 90 some odd percent of Immigrants in the past who have been allowed to go into the community awaiting their hearing return for these. But the Trump administration wants to create a crisis, and that's exactly what they're doing. And it's disgusting. They're doing it at the cost of human lives and enormous uh, human misery. That's just the reality. All right, lastly, uh, here's Greg Gutfield. He's on uh, The Five. Who's on The Five these days? Um, same crew. Waters still in. Yeah, and uh, here's Greg Gutfield. Uh, just sort of, he realizes he's basically peaked, I think, at Fox. So he's just sort of coming in. Yeah, I'm never going to get my own show. No, he has one, I oh, think. Oh, he does? Yeah, I think on the weekends, Greg oh, Gutfield man. show. But, oh, it, the Greg but I think it's gut show. check. It's the not good. <laughs> it's not going to. But not even. It's clearly not going to break out. And so. <laughs> it's because he's not funny. It's not going to be the breakout hit. So he is, uh, well, he's having those moments where he's like, ah, what, what the hell? I might as well just admit a couple of things. Maybe helps the Democrats. Yeah. You know, um, <laughs> I don't, I, of course they're going to attack him. That's what you would do. And, I, and let's be honest, if it were the adversary, uh, an adversarial from your party on the other side doing it during you, we would do the same How thing. How dare Obama <laughs> meet with a dictator with no preconditions? Exactly. Yeah, in so, 07. So, um, yeah. Do these people not understand the position and power they have in society? It's unbelievable. Like just talking it? about, you know, global conflicts like that. Like, yeah, we would be doing it. We did do it. Yeah. We did it. We did it. It's true. It's we did it. 
We did it. It really is amazing to me how I remember when uh, I was at the DNC in 2004. And I had just started doing this. Janine and I were there. Had been doing radio for maybe at that point six months, April to August, less, four months. And um, we met Larry Elder. He was going to come on, and maybe we were sitting with him. Uh, uh, you know, we were sitting with him in between a break or whatnot. And I can't remember if it was like, you know, uh, at the break, he's like, uh, you know, we were talking and. Janine and I were there. We had given up, you know, taken hiatuses from our careers. We were there for the politics. And Larry was like, hey, come on, that's, we leave it on the field. Wow. And we're like, what? What do you mean leave it on the field? Like we didn't, like, we were so not in tune with what he could possibly be saying. And he was basically saying, he went on, come on, like, you know, well, that's, we do, we do that for the show. I'm like, what? We were both like, are you serious? There's hundreds of thousands of people being killed. I'll show you feel like you the bastard. stakes of this were enormous at the time. And he was just like, oh, come on, you're not taking this that seriously, are you? Where's your sportsmanship? And we were, exactly. We were just like, we were supposed to be stable mates. I, I mean, I never like, I don't. Hey, no drum in the green room. Okay. Yeah, but he did give you a good story. It was a good you story. Use that one a lot. I, I, I because it, the 16 level. Sixteen years later, thank you, Larry Elder. The level. Thanks of, for being a sociopath. Yeah, well, but that's the thing is that I think they were all like that. I mean, I think you know uh, Sean Hannity. To his credit, he's I think worse off air, frankly. That's to his credit, of course. Calling from a six three one area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Hey there. Uh, hey, this is John from. Uh, hey. Hey. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hey. Hey. Yeah, this is John from uh, Eugene. Hey. Eugene, Oregon. Hey. Okay. Um, it's kind of a, a silly question, but uh, going on a date tonight with a Kamala Harris supporter. I'm a Bernie guy. Do you think it could work? I think it can work. I mean, I think. Um, look, when is the primary? Ooh, uh, in in Oregon? No, yeah. I don't know. All right, well, Bernie yeah, it sounds like a Bernie support. Yeah, I come on, it dude. Together, you got to get on it. <laughs> but, all right, let's just assume. I like, I like, I don't know who the primary day is, but I will tell you this. Cobb, the Irish is a fucking cop. <laughs> 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 all right, look, you have you have at least, I would say, eight to nine months minimum. So, um yeah, what's the longest relationship you've ever been in? in? Two years. Okay, so you can do this. Um, I would just, I would just pace it out. Just sit down nine months, and uh, give yourself, you know, each month you a certain milestone in which you accept. Like, so I wouldn't roll out the cop stuff too early. Yeah, just say you're for Medicare for all, and like that's yeah. your your issue about it. And I, this is the way I would do. It. I would say like, I think I, this is the way I would start. I would say, like, I think it took a lot of guts for Kamala to backtrack the way she did. Yes, that's exactly. Do it in a very <laughs> passive-aggressive way. Exactly. And you'd be like, you know who have some, might have some different ideas about Kamala Harris than you? And I'm just saying, because it's just somebody that I respect, her father. Yeah, Check and then at out. one point, uh. I would wait maybe two months to say something like this. It's like, look, you and I, we don't have kids, so we can't possibly know what it's like to be arrested because our kid is too sick to go to school. Right. You just drop that in and say, you know, because who are we to judge? Maybe kids who have sick kids, maybe uh, parents who have sick kids deserve to be arrested because their kids can't go to school. Yeah. Maybe she That's, was that maybe, actually, right. No, that was really this is good. A good technique. Maybe it was a good motivator Start to defend that policy. Maybe it was a good because I read this piece in Huffington Post about a woman who was like suffering from diabetes and who was dealing with severe economic circumstances and she went in jail for, you know, sent not her kid not being able to get to school one day, but maybe it was the motivation she needed. Right. I maybe take, it was like buy the bootstrap stuff. I would say stuff like, um, you know, criminal justice reform. I have to laugh at that. And then I mean, look, I support she, Bernie, but I the, obviously criminal justice reform. I mean, pfft, 
please. And then if, if she call. And then the thing is, I think that, is, you start to you start to parrot uh, Kamala Harris in such a way that she gets offended by what you're saying, and you say. I thought that's what you wanted me to say. I thought I'm just try- look. I support Bernie. <laughs> right. I'm just trying to respect trying you. To I thought out. you wanted to terrorize sex workers. This is gonna be a I- beautiful relationship. Yeah. <laughs> I thought that you thought not prosecuting Steve Mnuchin while prosecuting literally every other prosecutable person in the state of California, except for the Catholic Church on sex abuse, was brave. Yeah. I thought that's what you wanted. You should say like the one of the things I do respect about Harris is that she can see that Mnuchin's in office and shows no regret. And also the fact that she was actually donated to by Donald Trump several years ago will help her campaign against him. That's a disadvantage my guy doesn't have. Bernie Sanders never got a check from Donald Trump. That's the way I would go about it. That's what she... By the way, primary day is May uh, 20th, dude. Jesus. Remind, uh, okay, remember, I'm please. sorry. All right. Well, I'll come on, it. man. We got to win here. I... <laughs> it's not just about you All arguing right, give with us your an girlfriend. Update. Give us an update uh, and uh, how it's Total going. Bernie bro. Appreciate it. <laughs> I fucking know my girlfriend. All right. I will. Gobble. Oh, shit. I'll let you guys know. Day. Right, I'm sorry. Thanks. Have you guys seen this new meme that's going around for Elizabeth Warren fans? Where instead of saying that she I'm has a plan like for that, they use a word that rhymes with plan, saying like, Need to make some brownies? Elizabeth Warren's got a pan for that. Or yeah, gotta okay, get to soccer. Get all right. So yeah. a lot of her fans are really lame. But first of all, uh, I'm saying we gotta <laughs> deal with all these fans. So we gotta like so you know. First of all, plans are totally over. overrated, and most of these things are medium posts. So let's just calm down a little bit. Calling from a five one five area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Hey Sam. Hey. It's uh, Cheney and Bushes, now rom Commie one and uh, I have a couple things real quick. Wow, nice to talk to um, you. You too, buddy. I A uh, couple things. First thing is on your uh, Bernie Sanders uh, messaging point, I think it's very important that you always uh, end any point that, of what you're saying about like more taxes or sacrifice with, it's going to be more money in your pockets and less money in billionaires' pockets every time and even with stuff like the green new deal which is going to cost potentially billions of dollars um or more you you know it's what we're talking is like a drop in the bucket in terms of pentagon budget so a little bit for you a lot all this stuff you know doesn't doesn't necessarily entail more sacrifice uh from the working class yeah i right i i I mean i think i i I, obviously um, the you, you sell the upsides to these things, but I think the I think the country is um, I think people will be responsive to a a um, a politician who is asking them to do stuff and is and specifically is authentic and genuine enough to concede that this is not um this is not going to be a um a change that is going to come without any type of effort by the people this is like this is not elect me and and that's it and and, you know part of that was also you know obama's strategy but i think it also um i think it i think bernie is well positioned to, to to do that frankly. And so, um, and it's the one thing that I think will also distinguish him from others because, you know, the, the, it's easier for me to distinguish between, uh, these proposals, but I just don't think it's as explicit as it has been in the past. You know, there was, I think people, you know, when I look back on like Hillary Clinton's uh, debt-free college versus uh, um, Bernie's free college. You know, people were like, you're just splitting hairs. And to the extent that people were aware of the policy differences, there was a whole host of other things that made, you know, it created distinctions there. And there's just too many people on stage for the choice to be that stark. And so he's got to stake out a, um, not necessarily a, a policy uh, differences because it's there to the extent that it's there, 
but a sort of dispositional and a sort of um, a, just a relationship difference that he wants to have with the electorate. Well, right, right. Um, go ahead. I'm just curious, how do you convince people that doing more work is ultimately going to be worth their effort when they're working more than they ever have and they have no I don't think time? the idea is that you're going to work more. I think it's you're going to be that's how engaged. everyone else can sell it against Bernie. It's like they're all saying, I'm the most qualified and you vote for me and I will get it done and you can live your life independent of free I politics. I think if, if you come back at me and say you're asking them to get more involved and more engaged and people are tired and they're working too hard i think he's going to say i mean what i would say is a this investment is going to be the only thing that's going to make it so their lives are easier and b you're not telling them the truth you're just saying you can have this and you can have that and it's not going to cost you anything and nobody believes that and they shouldn't <clears throat> and i think that Second part of it. Everybody wants the material benefits, but that second part of it, well, the thing about, that the thing I'm about, actually the thing being Medicare straight all with is, you, I'm it, being straight Medicare with you. Medicare for all is more coverage for everybody and less premiums and let more money in your pocket at the same time. The only loser is investors and in, in insurance companies. Here. Yes, I agree. But I don't think that's going to be the selling point that is going to get Bernie over the top. I think the selling point that is going to get Bernie over the top is one where he distinguishes himself from the other candidates, not because of he's going to have less private insurance existing than they do. I think it's going to be because he is the guy who is actually being forthright and honest with us. And he, I think, is just yeah. uniquely positioned to do that because in many respects, he is asking more of people. It's, it's, it's built into the, his notion. And so instead of it being like this revolution that exists out there and we bump into it, he's, he's, he's alluded to this, but he has to make it more about, and you know, it has to be, there has to be more of a, a finer point put onto it rather than this campaign isn't about me, it's about us. He needs to, put a little bit more uh, meat on those bones and, and really right, right. say like, this is what it, you're, I'm expecting of you. And I just think that, that the, the country is um, amenable to that right now. And I think that it will also help distinguish him from the others because he needs something and it's not going to be policy is not going to do it. Because you have 20 people up there talking about their variation of what some of them call Medicare for all and some do not And I'm sorry, like I can I can make a distinct I, I can distinguish from that, but I don't think other people can. I'm not saying not there aren't other people, but the vast majority of voters up there. I don't think they can. I think what they will make their deter their decision on in terms of this primary at this point is. Who's the one that I can I can trust? Who's the one who is, you know, I, I can trust. And I think the way that you gain people's trust in this context, in this environment, is to say, I'm going to tell you some of the bad stuff, too. Appreciate yeah. the appreciate. Um, the hey, the second point I wanted to talk about uh, mm. was a Jimmy Dore story. You want to hear a Jimmy Dore yes. story? Yes. <laughs> yes. So, um <laughs> I got to start out with, uh, he's no longer with TYT, right? I heard that on Twitter, I think. I believe that is the case, yes. Yeah, yeah. All right, so I'm not disparaging TYT here, but uh, I am going to disparage Jimmy Dore. Uh, oh, back when uh, I worked at I uh, TYT. Up? I don't know how to do that. What? Oh. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> uh, back when I worked there, um, there was a issue, an incident that came up where um, Jimmy Dore – started like uh, calling the uh, CFO, blowing up uh, my direct supervisor's phone about somebody had been faving uh, YouTube comments or a one YouTube comment that was against Jimmy Dore. I don't remember what the comment was, but it was just like, Jimmy Dore is great at being a dumbass or something. You know, anyway, I'm suspect of that. And uh, 
And what so does that mean? They favored it. He's like, what does that mean? Like they favored it. They, they, you can heart. So somebody comments. under the Young Turks account liked a ah, comment. Okay. I see. That was anti Jimmy Dore. <laughs> and Jimmy's like going up to upper management. Like what the hell? Who's doing this from the Young Turks account? And so the, the CFO contacts my supervisor. Say, hey, do you know what, anything about this? And my supervisor's like, oh yeah, it was probably me on accident. I've been, hitting a bunch of faves for comments to, you know, boost audience engagement. And I probably just hit one that was negative on an accident. Sorry. And so you would think, Oh, well, that's the end of it. Right. But no, that's not the end. of. So Jimmy's like, no, 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 no. I know it was this guy. And he's mentioned me. And, uh, I had, I obviously didn't do this. Um, I, I would never, occur to me to do something like that. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, don't I you think that, that would, that that would that make him did. melt if he got a unfavor, you know, like somebody faved a uh, bad comment of him on YouTube Just on the off chance he sees it. Oh my God. Right. I don't know how he found out that somebody harder, like one of his fans mentioned, but he brings up my name. I didn't know he knew I existed. I'd never met the guy. He worked in a different office than me. Um, and and I'm just fucking pissed at this point. Like, why is he trying to get me in trouble for this thing? And I try to figure out, like, I, like I used to be a, a big fan. I listened to his podcast all the time. But then, like, when you guys got in that fight, you know, you just wrecked him so hard in my mind that I just really stopped caring about him. But I didn't unfollow him or, or like, you know, because he's with the company. So I'm, like, so pissed and I unfollow him. And, uh. He's just so sure that like, Oh no, it's this guy, this guy. Like he's such a petty little bitch. And, uh, <laughs> if anyone ever says like, Oh, maybe he, it wasn't Jimmy that cut out that, uh, Sam Cedar reference. And maybe it was one of his editors. Or something. Oh no, no, no. That was Jimmy <laughs> for sure. <laughs> well, I appreciate the insight. Um, I, I feel proud of myself about that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, all. all right. Thanks for the call. Appreciate it. Later. Bye. Bye. Some good dish to end the wow. show. Mm. <laughs> Folks, I'm sorry we're out of time. Um, I could have spent more time on that last one, but uh, we've got to uh, jump, as it were. Whoa. Look. Now, I, listen. I don't want to hear about people going in and favoriting Mean comments. Cross our hearts and hope to die. <laughs> That's actually the um, clip that Bernie should be doing. Um, folks, see you tomorrow. It might take all the strength I got to get to where I want, but I know. Somehow I'm gonna get there I wasn't looking when I just got caught Between the truth and the light bar But finding out won't make me feel any better Yeah, I know the clock is ticking But the meds are gonna kick in And my pilot light shines Somewhere the choice was made For the option where you don't get paid For the road that bends Before it finally breaks you I guess somehow I lost my drive Between the 101 and the 5 Do you know how far The detour takes you Yeah, I know the clock is ticking but the men's are gonna kick in And my pilot light shining bright The months shifted into years While I shifted in